Okay, we're on air, everybody. Welcome to the planning board meeting. And I, I'm just going to mention a couple things be, before we even deal with the minutes. One of them is that there may have been some misunderstanding. Are several of you here about the BA wetlands? Okay. Um, in, in an effort to really inform the public even more than we're required to inform the public, a notice was sent out to say that this was a public meeting so that you, if you were interested, you could come. A public meeting is not the same as a public hearing. At a public meeting, all our meetings are public, and so you cannot speak at this meeting. <coughs> However, there will be a public hearing scheduled at our April regular meeting, which is the third Tuesday of the month. And I'm sorry for any inconvenience to any of you. You're more than welcome to stay. It will be a while before we get to that amendment. But you're more than welcome to stay. And we have received several emails about it. Maureen forwards everything to us, and we read everything. So if you are interested in hearing any of the discussion, please stay. But know that you will not be able to speak. And I'm terribly sorry there was any confusion. We do apologize. But we tried to make an effort of informing everybody about everything when there is a fair amount of interest. So my apologies to you. OK, uh, minutes of the. Um, December 18th meeting, since we didn't have one in January. Any corrections or additions? Anybody? I have one little one on the third page. Um, Mr. Tatum command, commended my Godfrey instead of Mr. Godfrey. So, do I have a motion to accept and no other changes? I move to accept with the changes uh, the chair has stated. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. All in favor? So moved. The, the first order, oh, excuse me. We've received correspondence for this evening. What was I supposed to do with that? Um, a letter from Mr. Brock about Eastman Meadows, a letter from the town attorney about Eastman Meadows, a letter from Mr. and Mrs. Murray about Brothers Way, a letter from a CEO regarding K Pond RP permit, a report of the planning board activity for 2007, a letter from G. Schmader and J. Foley regarding BA Wetlands Amendment. amendment a letter from Oak Engineering regarding In by the Sea, a memo from the Public Works Director regarding Eastman Meadows, a letter from Mr. and Mrs. Best regarding BA Wetlands Amendment, a letter from Mr. and Mrs. Kreitz regarding Rudy's, and we just had two additional um, emails from Michelle Buckley regarding Rudy's and from Karen Coker regarding the Rudy's and the um, wetlands amendment to be discussed, or potential amendment to be discussed. So does anybody have anything else they'd like to add? OK, the first, yes. Um, the chair had asked me to, to provide a little comment on the letter that was in your package from Oak Engineers. Um, in that letter, the Inn by the Sea is suggesting that um, when they submit their amendment for site plan approval, their site uh, amendment to their site plan approval um, to change the provisions that allow outdoor events, that they are suggesting that the changes are not significant enough that the board should schedule a public hearing for the same night you consider the amendments. Um, Certainly the board can make a change and not hold the public hearing, but by holding the, the public hearing won't hold the applicant up any because you're doing both the same night. And uh, I think that the letter overstates a little bit how minor their change is. Um, there, it really is a change that requires an amendment from the planning board because the approval that the board had previously granted for outdoor events required that some of the meeting rooms had to be closed in order to achieve the maximum number. 
and the, what they're proposing to do now would actually to leave those meeting rooms open and still have a maximum number of people outside. So it does still, despite the opinion of the and by the C's engineer, still triggers an amendment to the site plan approval. It would still have to come to the board. Um, my suggestion would be to leave in place the decision that you made at the last workshop, which was, yes, when they come in, you'll hold a public hearing. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. So everybody agrees that that's what we're going to do. Anybody have any other opinion? I spoke with the engineer, and there seems to be a concern that um, the outdoor vent portion of the request is going to hold everything up, and they're trying very hard to finish their construction by the end of May, they can keep it coming in, etc. My suggestion was that, uh, first of all, I didn't see that the change in the events was going to be substantial enough that it would hold things up. But if for some reason things were raised at the public hearing and, and there was concerns, there would be plenty of opportunity at that point for the board to sever the project and just grant the approval for the sidewalks. And then they could go back and work on the whole outdoor event schedule. So I just didn't see a reason to sever it. And, and this would then be uh, in the April public hearing? It depends on whether they submit to the end of this month. If they submit to the end of this month, it definitely would be on the April 15th uh, planning board meeting. We would automatically schedule the public hearing on that, as you instructed at the workshop. Um, and then, you know, if you could decide to approve it, or you could decide to table it, or you could sever it into two pieces if something happened. So if we don't approve this sidewalk tonight, they're not going to make their, their deadline? I would say that you can't approve it tonight because they haven't submitted anything for you to review. This was just a letter that they wrote saying, my understanding is, you know, like most people who are running a very large construction project, they got a lot of stuff going on, they're really sensitive to their schedule, and I think they were concerned this could mess their schedule up. And I just don't see how it will. Probably materials, they have to wait to get the approval before they're going to order it. Uh, but you can't approve it tonight because you have nothing yeah. To, yeah, to approve. So all this is doing is trying to get you to do something for next month, okay. which it seems between now and next month, everything can be resolved. Okay. All right. Are there any other matters before we get into um, Eastman Meadows that we need to consider prior to? It seems like there was one other thing. I don't know what it is. Okay. Um, there, there was one more thing on Eastman Meadows. I, I just wanted to, with the Chair's indulgence, uh, just provide for the record information that there are two new members of the Planning Board um, who were not here last year, were not here for the first public hearing on the Eastman Meadows project. Um, staff has provided both of those members with copies of all the correspondence that the Board has received on that project that happened before they were on here. They've also received copies of the original submission from the applicant and copies of the minutes of the meeting where the public hearing was held. So they, they're, they've seen everything you've seen. Voluminous documentation. Maureen spent several hours going not, not through the documentation, but also going through, and not Eastman Meadows, but going through the process of site plan review to get them up to speed to do this. We couldn't use Eastman Meadows because that's under consideration now. Maureen had to use a prior um, subdivision that was put together. And is, we think they're as up to speed as they possibly can be as quickly as possible. So we'd like to thank all three of them for spending all that time. Thank you. Okay. Um, Eastman Meadows. Owens, do you want to? We've had a request, and it seems like a really logical one from one of the board members. Could you please briefly outline, and we didn't give you a heads up about this, the major changes that have been made from the original submission, which was deemed complete, to today, so that the people in the audience understand what kinds of changes you're proposing to make from the original submittal. I, I think that would be helpful, and then you can 
that will probably pick up anything that you were going to say anyway with okay. the changes. And if not, just add on to that. And then when you're finished, we'll have open the public hearing. Thank Fair you. Fair enough. Um, good evening. My name is Owens McCull. I'm a civil engineer with the firm of Sebago Technics here tonight on behalf of Wiley Enterprises, LLC. Uh, with me tonight is Joel Fitzpatrick uh, of Wiley Enterprises, uh, Nate Taylor, a design engineer from Sebago Technics, and Dale Knapp uh, from Stantec, formerly Woodlot Alternatives. Um, this project, is, uh, we originally came before the board on September 18th for a completeness review. Uh, had a site walk back on September 29th, uh, public hearing on October 16th. Uh, we actually then came back to the board uh, around December 18th, and uh, we've also met with the Conservation Commission uh, in early January of this year. Um, so we've been working through a, a process uh, to get back to where we are today. Uh, as the board uh, probably recalls, uh, the project is situated off Eastman Meadows, it's on uh, actually two parcels of land here, one that the applicant has obtained, and this one's under a purchase and sale agreement uh, for a total of 40.82 acres of land. Uh, the project will consist of 46 condominium units here, and then there's an existing farmhouse on the property over here uh, that will be uh, uh, carved off into a 15,000 square foot uh, lot by the developer. Um, at the last meeting that we were at, which, uh, well, it started back in October, uh, October 16th, when we had a public hearing. At that meeting, uh, there were some discussions uh, regarding um, uh, wetlands and how they were mapped, and uh, both from the public and some comments from the board. So uh, what the applicant did on his own was after that meeting, he actually uh, went to the town and asked who the town typically uh, retains to do a peer review of the wetlands and the typing of the wetlands. And the town responded that they have historically used Woodlot Alternatives, who is now part of Stantec. And so we contacted Woodlot Alternatives, Dale Knapp, who is here tonight, uh, to go out and walk and look at the wetlands. And Dale was asked to review the entire parcel. Dale actually ended up out there on three occasions, I think, it was uh, to take a look at that. And then we also even involved the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. Rodney Howe took a look at the site and Bob Green from the Maine DEP came down. And in a, in a summation, basically, uh, what we determined was originally the plan showed, and I'll, I'll go back to showing what the, the original plan brought a road in over here along this site with uh, condominium units right in this green space here and looped around with an access back out through here, in this location. Uh, the configuration and the, the density and the alignment of the units is still the same as originally proposed, but we ended up having to slide the whole, the whole development this way into the current configuration. So instead of the access points coming in here and looping around here, it now comes in here and exits over here. And this is the Mary Brock parcel right there in the center. So uh, we're coming in in two locations on the opposite side. Um, and the reason that that happened was uh, when we originally we had a section of RP2 uh, wetlands that we thought was in this piece here from an earlier mapping. And when Dale Knapp went out and looked at it and walked through that area, one of the things that came up was that this, although it was kind of a strange situation, there was a lot of mature vegetation out there, but the soils were a histosol, which is a very poorly drained soil, and under the Cape Elizabeth zoning ordinance, that constitutes an RP1 wetland. And under the ordinance in the RP1 wetland, uh, there are specific buffer setbacks that are required. And as a result of that, um, it required that we alter this area of the development instead of putting buildings and roads in this area, we needed to preserve it as a buffer in that area. So uh, we did do that and moved the uh, project over, which is what we presented at the 
uh, December 18th workshop meeting and then again discussed with the Conservation Commission on uh, January 8th. The essence of the project is still the same, uh, an internal road network, public utilities, uh, open space associated with it. And actually, as a result of this additional wetlands mapping, uh, the open space area actually increased uh, in size for the project. Uh, just to walk you through the, uh, again, just to refresh on the, the development approach, this is a condominium development. And I'll go on to the next screen here. Uh, targeted or marketed towards the 55 and older uh, uh, group. And the applicant uh, really believes that there is a market in this area. In fact, uh, during the course of planning this project, he's actually had some calls and correspondence from folks who would be interested in this sort of unit. It's also consistent with what the comprehensive plan has identified as a, a need in the town of Cape Elizabeth. So uh, we're trying to provide some diversity of housing and think this type of a project uh, would offer that. As part of the project, too, uh, because this is in the RV zone, there's mandatory open space zoning and also an affordable housing requirement. This project will create six moderate income level affordable housing units. That is actually one unit more than what we had uh, originally proposed back in September and October. And I'll explain that uh, in a few minutes on why we actually increased that. Again, as part of the wetlands work, one of the other things that uh, Dale Knapp did for us, and I'm going to go back one slide uh, while Dale was out there and walked the site. We asked him to come down into this spray, the air, this portion of the spray parcel, uh, to review the wetlands over in this area. Uh, we did identify a wetland, an RP1 wetland down in here, and a small, very small sliver RP1 wetland in this area here that came onto the property. There's another wetland here that's an RP2 wetland. And as part of that process, when Dale walked it, Dale also noted uh, three potential locations that might uh, constitute vernal pools. And we all know that that has been an uh, item of uh, more recent uh, concern on projects. So what we did was uh, Dale felt that there was one possibly in this area here, one over in here and then one down in this area here. We weren't too concerned about this one because there's well over a thousand feet from here to the development, so we certainly maintained the uh, prerequisite buffers. And then the other two pools was this one and this one here. And what we did was, is we took Dale's information and mappings and we actually went up through a series of meetings with the Army Corps of Engineers and Maine DEP to look, at the, look this over uh, go through their process uh, to verify that our development approach as proposed uh, would not have an adverse impact onto the vernal pool habitats. Uh, there is correspondence in the packet that we submitted that came back from Rodney Howe at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers that uh, indicated that uh, the way, the manner in which we're developing this project uh, will not have an adverse impact on those vernal pools. Uh, there's also information that he had met with the uh, U.S. EPA folks and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And basically, the key here is, uh, as I understand it, and Dale certainly can talk about this more, is we're essentially developing within an, uh, an old farm field area, an agricultural field, which is not a vernal pool habitat. The habitat uh, for the vernal pool species is typically uh, the wooded areas around the project. And what this graphic shows is this area around it is all open space. Uh, it's over, to over 200 acres of open space that includes open space from the Winnick Woods project, uh, open space uh, from the land trust, open space associated with the Cross Hill development, and then the, uh, the state and federal uh, parkland over here. So this open space actually provides a very nice habitat that the Army Corps and DEP and folks were very interested in and felt that since we're limiting this development to the farm field area, uh, that we certainly would be meeting the intent of, and requirements of the vernal pool uh, protection. The other thing on the property uh, is there's a, and I'm going to go to the next slide here, 
We are proposing to alter just a little over 13,000 square feet of wetland area. The first area is right in here. This is an area that is within the old agricultural field um, that has been tilled and disturbed over time. And then there's another area of about 150 square feet um, along the Mary Brock property uh, right here. And we actually have talked with the Army Corps and the DEP, met with them about uh, the proposed wetland alteration and have gained uh, support from those folks that this would be uh, an acceptable alteration. What we're proposing to do here is we're not proposing to put any buildings in it or, or, or I think maybe one little sliver of road fill goes through it right here, but we're not proposing to develop any hardscape in, those, in that wetland area, but what we are proposing is we'd like to essentially enhance that by doing some landscaping and planting in that area. And the reason for that is, is if you go out there right now, it, it's, it's sort of a stubble field in that area, and it seemed like developing all around it and leaving this stubble field area uh, just wouldn't fit in with, uh, with what we were trying to do. If it had been a wooded area or, or some sort of nicer pristine area, we certainly would have looked differently at it, and everybody seemed to agree with that. We also I think, talked about it with the board at the uh, uh, December 18th workshop meeting, and again, uh, we did go to the Conservation Commission and speak with them at the January meeting. The other one piece over here is adjacent to Mary Brock parcel, and it's just a small area of road slope fill that occurs uh, right here in this location. What I'd like to do just for a, a minute is actually ask Dale Knapp to step up here since I've thrown his name out a few times, so I thought it might be nice if you heard from uh, the person that actually went out there and looked at it. So Dale, if you don't mind for a minute, I'll leave my pointer right there for you. Good evening, Madam Chairman. Uh, counselors, my name is Dale Knapp. Um, I'm with Stantec, formerly Wood Alternatives. I'm a wetland scientist and a site evaluator. Uh, I was retained by uh, Wiley Enterprises uh, to basically do a peer review of the work that Mark Hampton had done, uh, as well as kind of uh, serve as a consultant, just basically reviewing the projects in terms of ecological and environmental impacts. The board wants to ask if the board, I and mean, Dale will be here all evening to ask questions. Please. I mean, you can ask questions now, or if you want, I can continue with the presentation. It's certainly up to you. Is there anything anybody wants to ask before we, because we're going to have plenty of time after the public hearing to I just want to be clear. You sure. said that there were 13,000 square feet of wetlands that are to be altered. Is that accurate? That's, yes. And what's the, what's the breakdown as between the two pieces that you, you pointed yep. out? Sorry, Dale. No this piece is about 12,800 square, 830 some square feet, and this piece is, I think, around 150 square feet of alteration. And that small, oops, sorry. Excuse me. Uh, Owens, there's also some cut and fill going on by the pond. You may want to mention that. Oh, yep, I was going to. Yeah, I will do that. Uh, if it would be appropriate. Uh, there's an existing farm pond here that was man-made and as part of the development project uh, there are a couple of areas we're going to uh, impact um, on that pond, fringe areas, but we're also going to add to the pond as part of the construction so in the end what happens is that existing pond remains, I think it's, it becomes slightly larger than what it is now but we're going to uh, do a little bit of work around this existing farm pond. I think the impacts occur right up here where a uh, future um, recreation building might go, and there's an, an enlargement area here. The pond kind of has this, narrows up at this end and gets very narrow, almost like a drainage ditch up in here, and we're going to widen that out. And then down at the back side, we're also going to widen out an area, and we have a little bit of side slope fill right along that area of the pond. There's one other pond on the site right here. Originally that pond was actually going to be disturbed, but uh, once we remapped the wetlands and Dale uh, provided some guidance, that pond now stays fully intact and untouched. And just to characterize that, I guess the, the majority of the impact is going to occur in an area that's basically cleared on a pretty regular basis. It's very highly disturbed. It's not really hydraulically connected to anything. Uh, there's no vegetation in it because it's mowed. And again, 
like Owens had said, it's gone under tilling, so in terms of functions and values as a wetland, very low. Any other questions I can answer? Sure. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to spend a couple of minutes uh, just talking about uh, our net density calculations for the project. One of the things uh, we also did uh, was we went through a pretty formal process to calculate what our allowable density was. And as I indicated, it showed it was 45. Uh, units actually, as Joel would say, 45.9 is what it came up with, but we, we went with 45, and then through a provision in the ordinance that allowed for a density bonus, we added an additional affordable and one market value uh, rate. What we did was, is we actually created a separate plan that showed precisely how we calculated net density, which includes deducting uh, the RP1 wetland areas, uh, deduct, deducting the actual areas of the roads, and we deducted the ponds, uh, we looked at steep slopes on the property, we deducted easements, which is all outlined in the town's ordinance. We provided all of that information as part of the submittal to OST uh, Associates, who is the town's peer review engineer, and they have reviewed that and provided in their memorandum that they concur with the findings and the methodology of how we calculated the net density for the project. And uh, as I indicated, we are actually increasing the number of affordable units from five to six, and the reason for that is uh, that because of that uh, density bonus provision of the one additional mark, uh, one additional moderate value, affordable, one additional market value, that's where the extra sixth one comes from. We haven't identified exactly where those units are going to go, but we suspect uh, that we will probably end up putting them in a couple. Uh, we have, let's see, one, two quadruplexes. We'll probably put them in uh, two of the quadruplexes, and then uh, we'll take a couple units within uh, the duplex units. These are duplexes, quadruplexes, and then we had four uh, single unit condominiums in that location there. The project uh, will include um, some private access uh, ways or roads to come in through the in through the project. Since this is a condominium project, the developer has decided uh, to keep the entire development private. Uh, so the driveways or roads uh, within uh, the project will be all private. There's no right of ways associated with them because it's all internal and private within the development. They'll all include underground utilities, public water, sewer, electric, uh, telephone. Uh, cable services, uh, an enclosed storm drain system uh, that will collect storm water and take it to a treatment pond. Uh, there will also be uh, pretty uh, extensive landscaping as part of it. We're still uh, going to propose a whole series of street trees. I think our original proposal did include the possibility of making this piece here a public road in this location with everything else private off of it. The developer uh, has since decided uh, that he would prefer to keep it all private. One thing we did do in going to all private is uh, we are proposing roads that would be 20 feet in width instead of the 22 feet in width, which is in the local uh, road standards. Uh, 20 feet in width um, is in several other subdivisions. Uh, it's, not an un it's not an uncommon width. Uh, the uh, Cross Hill subdivision has 20 foot uh, wide roads, uh, Wellback Ridge. Uh, another subdivision, the private portion of Spurwink Woods uh, and Abaco Drive also. And I understand the town even approved uh, a private uh, road, Arlington Way, recently at 18 feet. Uh, but we're, we're proposing to keep these roads all at 20 feet. Curb, uh, Esplanade, Sidewalk. Uh, there are two small sections of road that actually do go down to 18 feet because they're only servicing uh, four units here and six units in this location. Uh, we still will be planting uh, landscaping uh, street trees, essentially, along all of the roads uh, and sidewalk uh, within the development. We're also going to provide a 15-foot easement over the sidewalk that comes through here to connect into the trail uh, out behind it. And I'm going to go back one slide because it shows it a little better. But uh, there's quite a trail system. Uh, that exists within the open space and we're going to provide a connection along our driveway into the trail system here with the appropriate signage 
Then there's also another connection we're proposing that runs right along here as a trail through our open space connecting into the open space that the town has. And there's an existing tote road along here now which we will propose to follow. We're also, um, and we need to uh, discuss this further with the town planner before we come back, but we're also thinking that maybe it would be appropriate to put a couple of parking spaces um, over in here uh, right next to this main road or tote path that would come into the open space. Um, so if the town, if that works out, uh, we'd be willing to uh, build a couple of parking spaces uh, into that location. The public works director has also issued a memorandum uh, that indicated that if we go with uh, private, keeping this development all private, that um, he would like to make sure there is appropriate notation on the plan uh, that clearly states that it will remain private. I think what his concern is is 10 years down the road, maybe somebody would, the association would try to offer the roads to the town for acceptance. We understand that. We don't want that to happen. So what we're going to propose to do is we'll put the notation on the recording plat that gets recorded at the registry. We'll also put it in as part of the deed restrictions and in the association documents so that it is well documented uh, that, that this development is supposed to stay as a private uh, development. I wanted to spend a couple more minutes talking about utilities. Uh, the sewer on, on Eastman Road ends right about in, in here, as I recall. And what we're going to need to do is ex uh, put in a pump station within our development that would be a private pump station maintained by the association. And that pump station will have a force main that will pump down uh, to the gravity sewer. And we have met with the public works uh, director, the town engineer, on more than one occasion when we started planning this and have gotten to the point where in your packet there's a pretty uh, detailed plan that shows what we're proposing to do. Uh, one of the things that the town manager had asked us to do, and I believe the town has a, I think it was $3,500 they put towards each service, is as we come down through they want us to uh, stub off services. Uh, to the existing house lots along the road and the town is going to reimburse the developer as he comes through up to I think $3,500 of service so we're, we'll certainly do that and the idea is that these folks you know, should they ever decide they want to tie in the public sewer they could put in a pump station in their house and uh, pump into this force main that, that would terminate the gravity uh, sewer in that location. The buildings themselves uh, are proposed as duplex and quadruplexes with a few single units. What we brought along tonight was three color schemes of a typical uh, duplex design. Uh, we've presented these before and I think the ones we had before had more of a gray uh, tone to them. Uh, there still may be some in that, in that caliber but I think some of the comments from the board was that they'd like to see some schemes for some alternate colors. Um, so what we did was, is um, I took a look at some different earth tone colors, trying to stay with an earth tone concept, but varying the colors of the buildings and uh, throughout the development. And this is what we would be proposing. Uh, each unit would be landscaped around the foundation, uh, a front porch, uh, two-car garage. Uh, some of the do quadruplexes will have a one-car uh, garage, but uh, for the most part, there'll be two-car garages. Uh, varying uh, roof lines offset from each other uh, with, with window treatments around it, a walkway up to the building. And in between each driveway we're proposing a landscape strip to provide some separation uh, between each of the units. Um, I can come back to these when we get to the questions if the board has uh, questions on that. Also as part of the project that we're not at this point, we're not proposing to build it, but space is made for it is a, is a clubhouse right in this location here. And that clubhouse actually is in a pretty nice location because for those of you who are out on the sidewalk, I think the views of the pond from that angle are very nice. And what we would, the way we'd set it up is so that um, a deck could be built out off the back of it that would afford that sort of view uh, out over the pond for the enjoyment of that pond. Uh, 
Um, in regard to open space, I just wanted to touch base on the open space for a, for a moment while I was here. The green area represents the area of proposed open space on the project and through here. And what we tried to do was, um, of course, the natural features of the property also to help us, guide us in that direction. But the open space provides some nice linkage and building upon the town open space that's around the development. And what we are proposing to do is provide about 26 acres of open space, which is approximately 65% of the property. What's required in the zone is 40% uh, of it be dedicated as open space. And of that open space, um, under the town's uh, definition, about 72% um, is usable open space. And what's actually required in the zoning ordinance is a third uh, of the area be uh, usable space. The development itself will most likely be constructed in a few phases. Uh, at this point, when we come back, we will actually show the phasing lines uh, on the plan. But at this point, we're anticipating that the phasing, the first phase, will probably be this looped road through here, constructed. The pump station, of course, would be built, the infrastructure supporting it. Uh, the second phase uh, would most likely include um, probably uh, this loop here, and then the third phase, uh, most likely here and here. Uh, depending on how market sales go, it's impossible, which the applicant would hope they go quick. Uh, we may actually, if they go well and this phase gets built, we may opt to build the rest of it out in one phase, but we're setting it up so that it can be built uh, in phases with the first phase most likely providing this loop road um, through the project. As I indicated, the second portion, the, this, this road right here to create a loop, a loop section, comes through a fairly tight area right next to the Mary Brock property. Uh, we have uh, tried to push the road at a little bit of an angle so that there's about 30 feet of separation here and at the closest point about 10 feet to her property and then it widens back out to about 30 feet here. We've shown on our plan a uh, solid barrier, a six foot stockade fence with some plantings. Uh, the applicant has met uh, last week with Mary Brock, I believe, and Mary's here. <laughs> uh, I see her out there. And we're, it was an initial meeting with her. We're more than willing, the applicant is more than willing to um, work with Mary if, it, if during the course of the approvals if she would prefer not to have a fence and maybe have more, have a landscape buffer, maybe some plantings on her property instead to, to increase the buffer. Um, the developer, the applicant is, is, will continue to work with Mary. We've had an initial meeting with her and uh, hopefully uh, we can work through um, some additional landscaping out in that area. The other item I wanted to spend a moment talking about on the project uh, was traffic generation. Um, in our prior submittals, uh, we submitted a traffic study. Uh, this sort of a development typically generates uh, relatively low traffic in comparison, say, to a single family residential subdivision. Uh, that traffic study was sent out for a peer review by Wilbur Smith Associates. Tom Erico did complete a, a review of that. Uh, Tom Errico uh, wrote back that he felt that the existing uh, road system uh, has the capacity to handle the traffic uh, for the project. He did suggest that we look at uh, or possibly go back and count the traffic afterwards and look at some traffic calming consistent with the town's traffic calming uh, requirements. And, you know, we are certainly willing uh, to uh, look at traffic calming and I think what we would ask the board for consideration is um, to develop, maybe develop an approach on what that traffic calming might look like. We can certainly work with the planner and the town engineer but um, if the developer would prefer to work sort of within some knowns instead of a lot of unknowns as we go forward that, that makes it um, a lot more appropriate so that the developer understands what his obligation might be for traffic calming. So we are putting that out on the table if that's appropriate to work with uh, 
the town planner, the public works director, and some of the town planner probably talk to the police chief, whatever we come up with. And then um, if the town's peer reviewer would want to get involved, we would certainly work with them. One more question that came up uh, at the last meeting uh, we were at was, uh, along Eastman Road, when we put the sewer in, we're going to be putting the sewer in along the southerly side. And uh, a couple of the board members asked about the potential of widening the shoulder as we come through to provide a little more of a pedestrian corridor along that section. We did look at that, and our concern uh, with that is that along Eastman Road, there's a lot of mature tree growth almost right up next to the edge of pavement that helps form the canopy as you drive along Eastman Road. And if we did that, uh, we're concerned that uh, that would result in removal of a lot of those trees and would open up that area. There's also areas of some fairly steep embankments um, <coughs> that are ledge, I think, <laughs> um, along that section. So as we looked at it, um, we thought that uh, that would be very, very difficult to achieve without a pretty substantial expense uh, and infringement onto adjacent properties. So uh, what we would ask is not to do that just because of the physical limitations along the roadway. The other, I, other thought we had is if we open that road up and we clear it out, um, it, you know, we talked about traffic calming. I think we had a, quite a discussion at one of the meetings on it. If we open that road up, widen it out, it, it kind of has a counter... Um, it's kind of counter to traffic calming along the road because one of the, if you, in the traffic calming uh, section of the town's ordinance, it talks about trying to make the fill narrower of a road, uh, maybe putting signage in along the road. And the idea is to uh, deter people from, you know, wanting to speed. If you build a wide road that's linear and long with not many vertical curves, people will have more of a tendency to drive to those speeds. So. Um, we're a little concerned that that might also be counter to trying to keep the speeds a little slower along uh, Eastern Road. As we move forward, uh, just to give you an overview again of permitting, we'll need to go through uh, in addition to the town permitting, which is the resource protection permit and the major subdivision approval, we do need to go to the main Department of Environmental Protection for a Site Location and Development Act permit. Uh, we actually are sending out notices to um, direct the butters and we'll be advertising, I think it's April 3rd here at the, at the, uh, in these chambers, we have a public informational meeting that we're obligated to have as part of the site location process. So um, there is another public meeting we'll be having on the April, April 3rd right here. Uh, town uh, volunteered to let us use this room for that meeting. We also need to get a Natural Resources Protection Act permit to the DEP for those wetland alterations. And as part of that, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, will be involved and we'll, uh, we'll look at the project. We, are, we have previously asked for a couple of waivers, and I think the general consensus of the board was that they were appropriate. Uh, those waivers included um, allowing us to... The, the ordinance says the subdivision plan needs to be drawn up a scale of one inch equals 40 feet. Uh, we can do that, but what happens is it creates multiple sheets. Uh, we had asked the board about keeping it on one sheet for continuity. The town engineer thought that was fine. I think at one of the earlier meetings, the board agreed with that. Uh, the other one was a lot by lot uh, soils survey, and, or soils analysis, and a high intensity soil survey. Uh, we had asked for a waiver for those simply because uh, it's all in public utilities. Uh, we have had a fairly substantial wetlands investigation done um, of the property. We did a full topographical uh, survey of the development area where the condos are, and um, we had all the information to work through the design, and, and the sense was, and the town engineers wrote again in his memo that, that those would be a reasonable uh, request uh, for the project. With that, I will... Um, uh, sit down and uh, would the board like me to leave one of these graphics up? Is there a preference on which one I should leave up? This is sort of the overall one? Or? Sure. Okay. 
Uh, if there's any questions or do you want me to? Why don't we wait and have the public hearing first and then we can respond to questions that arise and questions that we all have too. Thank you. So, okay, without um, further ado, we will call the public hearing. And again, I would like to mention that anybody who wants to speak is certainly, please come up. I would like you to identify yourself and where you live. In addition to that, I urge you to go to the town hall, I mean, come to Maureen's office, look at all the plans, look at the, this huge book of specifications and information. Uh, they're all available to the public and available to you. You can look at anything you like. We do read every email that we receive. I have a whole file full, which I read twice because we read them before with the original uh, submission and, and afterwards. We do listen to you. Um, we do have to follow code and we do have to make some decisions both looking at you as the butters and the developers in trying to come to some you know, rational decisions taking the code always into account, because that's why we have it. So with that said, I will invite people to please come up to the podium. Thank you. <coughs> you might also want to spell your name if it's complicated. Thank you. Excuse me, my name is David Plimpton, P-L-I-M-P-T-O-N, -P -P 1000 Sawyer Road, about 0.7 miles from uh, the Eastman Meadows project. Um, I, I did go to the city hall uh, and, and met with Maureen and looked at the most recent application. Uh, and I really only want to discuss one point tonight because uh, uh, you know, Owens mentioned the net residential area uh, computation, and I was concerned with that, with the initial uh, proposal, and I was interested to hear that there was going to be a peer review by OST Associates, and I looked at that, and I've heard Owen, but, and, and you'll have to bear with me, because I'm going to have to look at the language of the ordinance with you, but I think there's a huge, huge disconnect between what the calculation that the developer has made and what the ordinance requires. And what I'm going to do is talk about uh, three specific areas where I think large areas of the project that are required to be deducted for the calculation have not been deducted. Now the first is I want to say that this net residential area computation is in section 19.1.3 of the definitions and unlike many other things in the ordinance that the planning board deals with where there are discretionary standards to be applied, that's not the case here. It says, net residential area shall be determined by subtracting the following from the gross area. It doesn't say maybe. It doesn't say in the discretion of the planning board. It says shall be. The first area is the portion of the site used for outside parking streets and site access. Now, the developer has taken the streets out, but outside parking includes driveways. Site access includes driveways. You have sidewalks here. Uh, and, and by the way, I'm going to give you an illustration of the concepts uh, taken from the old plan because I just saw the new plan the other day and I didn't have a copy of it. So. I've illustrated all those areas which I think need to be deducted. Uh, it says that the developer, sh uh, you, you can d take 15% of the gross area or at the option of the applicant, the actual area devoted to streets, parking, and access drives. Now to me that means all areas that are used for access. That includes sidewalks, driveways, and the street. They have deducted the street, but not the other things. I would, are you counting sidewalks in that deduction? Of course. That's access. It doesn't say vehicular access. It says site access. That includes pedestrian and vehicular. Okay. I'm skeptical, but go ahead. Look at the language. 
Uh, I am. You, I see I mean, references says, to vehicles. And, and by the way, I think that this ordinance should be interpreted broadly to give the protection. In other words, the developer gets the right to have uh, cluster housing and to put, uh, you know, get economies of scale and put a compact development in there. And in return, there are specific areas that shall be deducted. So it should be not only mandatory, but it should be interpreted in a way that, that is comprehensive and takes into account the broad intent of the ordinance. Now, the next area I want to raise is any isolated portion of the site that is cut off from the main portion of the site by uh, major streams, similar physical features, such that it creates a major barrier to the common use or development of the site. Now, in the northwest corner, uh, you can see it there. There's that little, it's not that little actually, Excuse but it's a sliver. Can, can you put up the zoom? The, the, clo the, the like closer in, no, the uh, no, graphic. I, not, it's the very northwest portion. I, that the one? I think he's referring yeah, to this. Yeah, that's area. it. That is cut off, obviously, by the RP1. It can't be developed in common with the site. Now, I talked to Maureen about this, and she says, oh, no, that has to be, that doesn't need to be deducted, because that can be developed. And maybe it can be developed. I actually don't think it can be developed, because there's 125-foot minimum street frontage in this zone, and there's only 65 feet of frontage. I, I did it by scale. Not only that, you don't even have to look at that, because if it's not capable of common development on this site, it has to be deducted. It hasn't been deducted. Now, the, the third point, and then I'll, I'll give you this uh, illustration and some specific comment I made referring to the ordinance in an October 31st email. This, this, I think, is the most important area because uh, it says, this is five, any portion of the site that is unsuitable for development in its natural state because of topography, drainage, or subsoil conditions. Those are very site-specific criteria. It doesn't talk about, uh, you know, in general. It talks about site-specific, as it should, because we're looking at this site. Then it says, this shall include the following. And it talks about RP1. It talks about some of the areas that Owens met, mentioned, slopes, exposed bedrock. It, but that's not exclusive. Therefore, you have to look at RP2. And there's a huge portion of the site that's RP2. Now, I'm not saying that the developer can't subtract those. But what he can't do, and apparently this has been interpreted as a discretionary thing by the planning board in the past, what he can't do is say, oh, RP2 can be developed you know, for something in some cases, so therefore we're not going to deduct it. You have to look at the specific, you know, and we've had a peer review to show uh, that, and all the comments indicate that some of this RP2 is very wet. It's, it's Mary Brock pointed about, pointed out all the wetness right next to where, uh, you know, this, this road is going to be built. So to me, it's incumbent on the developer to come in and say, this portion of our, all this RP2 is suitable for development, you know, because of topography, drainage, or subsoil conditions. Otherwise, we don't know whether it's suitable, because it may be unsuitable. Much of R2 is unsuitable. I mean, very few uses are permitted. So, if you look at the specific language of the ordinance, I think that they have to come in and show that this RP2 area is suitable for development, for topography, drainage, subsoil conditions. I don't think they can do it, but they have to come in and try to do that, or else this ordinance is being misinterpreted. It, you know, it, it, legally, it's not being applied properly, and all I'm asking is for the benefit of the area, the neighborhood, the residents, apply this ordinance the way it's required specifically to be uh, applied and, and then let the chips fall where they may. If the RP2 uh, can be developed, then so be it, but come forward. But certainly all of those 
uh, access areas that are just like a roadway except that they're narrower or they're a private driveway or they're used for parking ought to be deducted and certainly that isolated area ought to and then uh, they ought to come back and, and uh, convince you that the RP2 is suitable for development so it doesn't need to be subtracted. Um, what I have is, I, unfortunately, I'm, I apologize, I had to use the old plan, but I illustrated the areas in question shown on the old plan so you can see the extent of it. I realize it's changed because the configuration has changed, but uh, with your indulgence, that will at least give you a little idea of what I'm talking about. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Mr. Plimpton. Uh, someone else? No one else that wants to say anything about Smith Meadows? Good evening. My name is Lisa Fernandes. That's F-E-R-N-A-N-D-E-S. And I'm a resident of Sawyer Road between Eastman and Stillman. And I'd like to submit the following comments. Uh, first of all, I do share Mr. Plimpton's concern about the density calculations. I don't understand the technicalities quite as much as he probably does, but I do think what he's raising warrants additional investigation. Number two, I'd like to speak a little bit more about the traffic issue. Uh, Owen mentioned uh, Eastman Road and the fact that, uh, I think it was on peer review, the existing road system can, quote, handle the traffic that's expected. Um, Sawyer Road in particular is the prime, I believe it would be the primary feed for Eastman Road for Portland and South Portland trips from, from Eastman Meadows. And that particular stretch of Sawyer Road is already pretty heavily burdened uh, with what I would consider a serious traffic problem uh, that has not yet been addressed. Uh, the road is currently not safe for existing traffic levels and speed behaviors. It's a very narrow, twisty stretch of, of Sawyer Road posted at 25 miles per hour, but commonly, commonly sees travel in excess of 45 miles per hour and quite often more. I personally have witnessed three near collisions with pedestrians and cyclists uh, within 100 feet of just my house in the last 12 months. So we're now proposing to add the commutes for nearly 50 uh, additional homes with the current calculations, nearly 50, probably 46 it looks like, and in most cases two garages each. So that indicates I mean, I don't know what, what the statistics are, but I'm saying between 75 and 100 vehicles, potentially. I don't, I don't really know. Um, and although this neighborhood will be marketed to 55 plus, I, I don't think, um, you know, that's being made an irrevocable component of um, how, the, how the deed is written or the covenants. Um, so I'm concerned not so much about children. I think there were past comments about children maybe living in, these, in this neighborhood, but I'm, I'm more concerned about commuters who would probably engender the same really dangerous behaviors on Sawyer Road, that stretch between Eastman and Stillman. It's, it's a very big problem. Um, so the only way that I think this density could work is if the affected neighborhoods, not just Eastman, uh, but the affected neighborhoods do not experience diminished, you know, traffic safety, really. And if it goes through as proposed at the moment, uh, I, I strongly believe we'll be far less safe on Sawyer Road than we are right now. Uh, if someone disagrees with that, I, I really would like to see, you know, the studies or the proof that would support, support that. It's a, it's a huge concern. And my final point has to do with the fact that... Um, and I realize I'm coming to this, to this project at the 11th hour, but I do just want to express that I, I am sort of fundamentally saddened by the fact that uh, this particular type of development is happening in active agricultural land. And um, 
over 80% of the residents of our town so that they value the rural character of Cape Elizabeth, which as we know is a direct result of open space and agricultural uses. As a town, we're extremely fortunate to be in the unique position for Southern Maine of still having for the moment a local farm culture and a local food production culture. It hasn't disappeared yet. Um, so while I may be too late to, 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 to contribute that idea for, for the Sullivan Farm on Eastman Road, not having organized you know, any of our community resources to keep it in farming and ensure compensation for the landowners, um, I just hope that the loss of another Cape Elizabeth farm will prove to be uh, a learning moment, as the cliche goes, you know, these days, because once that farmland's gone, it is gone forever. So thank you for letting me comment. Thank you. Other comments? There are no, no other comments. I'm going to close the public hearing. So I'll give one more chance to anybody who'd like to speak. Thank you very much. The public hearing is now closed. Owens, would you like to come up and um, perhaps we can take the major points raised before we open it up? Or does the board choose to open it up right away to <coughs> our questions and uh, or shall we deal with the density and the traffic, which seem to be the two major sticking points? I can offer, I guess, my thoughts on that. Um, you know, as far as the density goes, um, we have uh, followed the uh, ordinance and how it has been applied consistently over past projects. Uh, we've done nothing out of the ordinary, nothing that hasn't been followed in the past for projects. Um, the planner is actually, there was a memorandum that was issued a few years ago on, on this whole thing on RP1, RP2, and I don't have it with me, but I think she had passed it back out on the interpretation. Um, so, uh, you know, we have consistent, we applied uh, the net density definition consistent with how it has been historically followed and applied uh, by this board. Uh, we also, as I indicated earlier, went to, I've actually never done this before in the town, but we actually prepared a separate net density plan, a full 24 by 36 inch plan that we put together that showed precisely how we did it with the intent on giving it to the town's peer review engineer, uh, which we did and say to the town's peer review engineer, please look at this and tell us if, we've, if we have calculated our net density calculations correctly. And OST Associates did complete that review and they provided back in their mem memorandum they concurred with how we calculated our net density. So we believe that we've done everything consistent with the ordinance now as far as you know the interpretations of the ordinance or uh, issues around that, uh, that's more of a, I guess, we'd leave it up to the town on how you interpret those, but we have uh, applied the net density very consistently. We did deduct the RP1 wetlands, which under the definition it says you have to deduct the RP1 wetlands. We did. It doesn't say deducting buffers. It doesn't say deducting RP2 wetlands, so we followed that literally. Um, as far as isolated cutoff goes, I guess I would like to make a comment on that. Uh, this piece over here has direct connection to Eastman Road. And, you know, that piece could be developed as a trail connection coming into the, into the site. Uh, it, is, it is definitely accessible directly from an Eastman Road, um, accessible um, back into the open space, the rest of the open space. There's the potential that a tra another trail could be added out there. Um, so it can be developed, it can be used. It, it's not isolated, it's not separated from public access from the development. It is part of this development and we could we actually put a trail system. We had talked about it at one point on running a trail through there, but felt in the end this was the best link. Uh, to make, and we talked about that link with the Conservation Commission. Uh, the deduction we did for roads, uh, 
uh, we deducted, the ordinance allows us to either take 15% or deduct the actual area of the roads. We deducted the actual area of the roads. And historically on subdivisions, I guess the question was made about deducting the driveways. I have never seen that on a subdivision, you have your roads that service the lots or the housing, and I've never seen the driveways deducted from it, and I don't think it says that in there. I think one of the problems is that you're proposing no right-of-way, and it's actually that the, the code is not clear about, because it's a condominium development, and perhaps Maureen would like to jump in here and say a few words about this, because normally the right-of-way takes into account whatever there might but be. But it doesn't take... But there is no right-of-way here. Even it doesn't a right take into right account the driveways. Right. Even a right-of-way in a subdivision wouldn't take into account the driveway from the subdivision right. to the house. No, that does not. But would you like to well, I, jump in and I say the, something about this? I think the question was, the board usually doesn't see condominium projects, I mean, except for the portion of the Spurwink Woods project. We haven't seen a condominium plan in many years. But it is very, very typical for condominium projects to have their own internal road system without an official right-of-way. Um, obviously, if this was a single-family subdivision, uh, the position would be that a 50-foot-wide right-of-way should, should be created, further that it should be public, um, and that within that 50-foot-wide right-of-way would sit probably a road that is 22 feet wide. And the reason you have the 50 feet is because the town is responsible for taking care of the road, plowing the road, for maintaining the road, for taking care of the drainage that's running adjacent to the road. Um, in this instance, and in the instance of almost all the condominium projects in Cape Elizabeth and pretty much everywhere else, um, the roads are the responsibility of the condominium association. So uh, you can plow up sidewalk, you can plow your snow off of your road onto the front lawn of the condo unit because it's all one lot. There's no individual lot ownership in the, in the condominium project. Um, the other thing uh, the chair had asked is there is one condominium project that I'm aware of at Cape Elizabeth, uh, Cape Woods Drive off of Mitchell Road, where they did lay it out with a 50-foot wide right-of-way and it actually has been accepted by the town and is plowed by the town. But all the other condominium projects, you know, Hobstone, Wildwood, Canterbury and Cape, um, all of those have private road systems that are maintained privately uh, by those kind of needs. And, what, and what's the road width? It varies. And, and to be honest with you, um, when I met with the developers, and, and I said this with the Spurman Woods project as well as with this project, um, I have seen condominium designs that I have considered inferior because they basically look like someone scattered dominoes across the landscape. And you've got parking lots, you've got, you've got condominium units basically facing on the parking lots, scattered in a haphazard fashion. Um, you can't even figure out where they're what, but the unit numbers are, it's a little bit hazardous for emergency personnel. And I have advocated to developers who have submitted to the planning board that they lay out their condominium like a neighborhood. And so what you are actually seeing is a condominium plan that looks like a lot of a single family subdivision because every single unit faces onto the road and there's a sidewalk that runs along the front of the unit. And that is something that I think is a positive thing. But it doesn't change the fact that in the end, it is still one lot. And what we're talking about when we have units face onto the road is that we're trying to create a neighborhood feel rather than that kind of scattered buildings and parking lot kind of feel. But it is still one lot. In a typical subdivision um, in public roads, to the extent that sidewalks are required, are sidewalks typically inside or outside of the 50 foot? Inside. Path? They're almost always within the 50 foot wide right of way because if they were not in the 50 foot wide right of way, the public wouldn't have the right to walk on them because they would be on private property. And we have, in actually, a few instances where we're trying to retrofit in older areas. We don't have enough room to put in a sidewalk at the Esplanade. We've approached a budget property that has been asked for public access easements where we put the sidewalk on their property and they give us an easement to walk on. So if you were trying to look at this and make it as analogous as we could with a public roadway with sidewalks, since in a public roadway, 
you include the entire right-of-way, which would include the sidewalk. It seems to me the closest analogy would be to say that the sidewalks here would also be included with what we're interpreting to be the roadway. The difference is that this is not a single-family subdivision with a public right-of-way. Uh, I understand Mr. Plimpton's comments, and I was listening very carefully to what he was saying, but then I was looking at the words that are in the ordinance for the net residential acreage. And it says, under number one, and it's more a general sense than a specific portion of the site used for outside parking, streets, and site access. The second sentence actually goes on to be much more specific as to what that entails. This portion shall be deemed to be either 15% of the gross area of the property or, and we always have given the applicant this option and they always take it, at the option of the applicant, the actual area. And it lists the actual area devoted to streets, parking lots, and access drives. I actually looked, we have defined the term parking lot in the ordinance on the following page and a parking lot is a lot or part thereof used for design for the parking of three or more vehicles in conjunction with the use other than a single family home. The parking lot includes the parking spaces, aisles, and access ways. I think parking lot really sounds like a much more formal setup than um, a driveway for a condominium unit. Uh, from a, and then access drive says to me, driving. So I don't, while I agree that sidewalks provide at important access to a site, I'm a big advocate for sidewalks, I don't think it's a drive. Um, and in computing, and then to get to your question, in computing the area of streets or ways, the full width of the right-of-way shall be included. So if the applicant had chosen to create a right-of-way in this private condominium project, I would agree that the entire width of the right-of-way, including the area of the sidewalk, in area where nothing was happening but it's just within 50 feet, should be deducted. But where they're not including right-of-way, I think you know, there's room for the board to take an alternative interpretation. But there is at least some public right-of-way. Excuse me, Elaine, when you're speaking, could you speak into the mic because oh, we are sorry. televised. Okay. Thank you. I believe there at least is some proposed public right-of-way for a portion of the sidewalk uh, yet to be shown on the plan, but I think runs along the right-hand side. Is that right? And that was, uh, the, the idea behind that was uh, when the original development was in place, and I, yeah, either that, thank you, uh, that's that the side east of Mary Brock's property mm -hmm. was not proposed to be developed at all. And if you look at it from a point of view of a conservation commissioner and open space, you have a trail on the western side of the property, and then you have this long piece of open space that runs down on the eastern side of the property. And if you live in the neighborhood and you want to take advantage of this open space that still has been preserved, you've got to walk all the way down past the project, down to that trail, come all the way around to get back onto this other open space. And in order to make the open space that the applicant was providing more fully available to the whole neighborhood, the proposal was to require the developer to put a trail along this other side so that the people on the west end of, of Eastman Road would be able to come in on the west side and the people on the east end of Eastman Road would not have to walk all the way over but could come in on the east side. Subsequently, the applicant had to redesign and um, town staff uh, was adamant that a set, a two means of access needed to go into the project, that one full access drive and emergency access was not a good design for the project. So the area where we had talked about a trail became a, became a road, a private road into the condominium project. And so instead of requiring that you know, extensive amounts of boardwalk be constructed to move the trail over into the wetland, uh, the idea was that the applicant, because remember, this is all private. Unless you reserve access rights to the public, only the, only the condominium owners can use this land. So the idea was for this sidewalk along this side would include a, an easement for the public to walk along that sidewalk to get down into this, this area to the south, which was the original concept all along. It was just to enhance the opportunity for the neighborhood to still use the open space that was going to remain. So it's not, we have never 
required developers to give us pedestrian easements and then made them deduct them as part of their, their net residential acreage calculation. It's something that happens after the fact. What about the ARPA two? Well, the ordinance, I think, is, is fairly clear. Under number five, it says any portion of the site that is unsuitable for development in its natural state because of topography, drainage, or subsoil conditions. And again, I see that more of a generic overarching umbrella statement. And then it's very specific. This shall include the following. Land located within the RP1 critical wetland district, which has been deducted. Any area of one or more contiguous acres with sustained slopes of 25% or more. The applicant did do an analysis of all the slopes and determined that they never had one acre of sustained slopes of 25% or more. Any area of exposed bedrock. The applicant did go in and make a, an estimate of what, how much area was exposed bedrock and deducted that. Um, this definition has been discussed by past planning boards. And I distinctly remember asking the question, do you want to deduct RP2 wetlands? And the response was, no, because they can be developed. And if you go to the resource protection chart um, and you think about development not just being construction of a condominium, although in fact you can do that as well, um, under the list for RP2, there are several types of things that are allowed. And you know, trail construction is allowed, driveway construction, road construction in our RP2 is allowed. You can actually get a permit to expand an existing home, although no one's ever done it. Uh, you can build a new home in an RP2 if you can get the permit. And I think that was the basis for the planning board at that time saying, we think RP2 can be developed if you want to. The ordinance allows you to do it under certain circumstances, and therefore it doesn't have to be deducted. I understand um, Mr. Plimpton's concern that there's been no, the applicant hasn't actually shown a development plan for the RP2 wetlands. We strongly discourage <laughs> developing an RP2 wetlands. Um, I think he's making this the suggestion to the board that um, taking a consist consistent position that every time you have an RP2 wetland based on the ordinance permitted uses list, can be developed, you shouldn't have to deduct it. And he's saying not all RP2 wetlands are created equal, and that in each site you should uh, make that determination on a site by site basis. I suppose you could do that. Uh, I have concerns with the consistency of that approach. Uh, the, the idea of the net residential acreage calculation is that a property owner ought to be able to look at the zoning ordinance and have a, a good, solid idea of what they can and cannot do. And most property owners who are selling their property, how much you can develop that property is a key piece of what you can sell it for. So many people, before they make an offer on any piece of property, will do this calculation because it's very important to know whether you can get 40 units or 10 units. It, it's, it's, it, it determines how, how valuable your property is. So leaving that open on a case-by-case -case basis may do a disservice to the residents of the community. Are you aware of any historical precedent within Cape Elizabeth where the RP2 has, in fact, been deducted? No, you've ne it's never been done. Other questions about density? Well, this this may impinge on density, so maybe we let me raise this now. Um, should we allow that the ordinance calls for a 22-foot road for um, is the minimum road site actually that's listed in our subdivision ordinance, and essentially the developer is asking for an exception here, and this might be something we want to discuss because if we determined not to allow the 20-foot the 22 feet, it might affect the, it probably would affect the density by one, perhaps. I don't know, I haven't run the calculations. I only tried to check your calculations. And I, I did worry about the right of way, but then found out that that was not applicable in this case. 
So does anybody have any thoughts about that at all or want to ask any questions about it or have any observations? I remember somebody mentioning that Cross Hill had 20-foot road. And that's, a, is that a, that's a, been accepted by the town? Before this ordinance was written, though. Cross Hill yeah. is public road. And, and, and the, the two concerns are adding more pavement width right. versus public safety. And I think Barbara and I were on the board a few years ago when the chief took us out there, parked a fuel truck in Cross Hill. And it's pretty clear in a snowbank situation, you can't get a fire truck past the fuel truck, uh, which uh, is a reason to keep the 22 versus the 20. And Maureen, I'm just wondering whether the chief has looked at these uh, roadway widths, hammerhead turnarounds in the units and had any comments for us. Um, I think you're aware that our fire chief has retired and mm. we have a brand new chief that I believe is going to be confirmed next Monday night. Um, the chief that retired in January did review these plans, mm -hmm. um, but he didn't see the most recent version. So he saw the prior version. He had issues with the fire hydrant water pressure, if you remember. So there's no, I haven't received any comments from um, the soon to be appointed fire chief on the. The earlier review, did he comment on the, the roadway width was the same then, wasn't it? Yeah, the, it was road width, the road width was, was narrower, is narrower now. However, the applicant has pointed out to me that the uh, condominium section of Spurwink Woods, which was reviewed by the prior fire chief, mm -hmm. was 20 feet wide. This is a lot curvier, though. I have some concern about a 20-foot road. Well, I, I, and, and, I, and these are very curvy streets. Um, so if a, if a fire truck had to get in, it makes it very tight and makes it much more difficult. I personally am somewhat concerned about a 20-foot versus a 22. I would prefer a 22-foot road, which meets code. I'm more concerned we don't have a review of it. I mean, I, I wouldn't profess to be a fire safety expert by any stretch. I, I do share your concern about the width. Well, but when you have two cars and people today are driving these behemoth cars, <laughs> even though gas is so expensive. Uh, oh, and what, uh, if you go 22 feet, did you run those numbers? What's that do to your density? I, I haven't ran those numbers. I, I, it probably isn't going to change it, but one or two the, at any rate. The, uh, uh, our, the Joel has contacted the new, the new to be fire chief who wanted to wait till he came on full time to sit down and go over the project. And Joel is going to be meeting with him as soon as he comes on full time uh, to, to take a look at the project. Um, if I could offer this, we can also, um, we have a pretty, we could a fire truck through the site, actually, with what they call an auto turn software. Some of the engineers are probably familiar with that on the board, and it shows pretty accurately how a truck of that size moves through uh, the project. So we can actually document that and demonstrate that. Uh, you know, what we were trying to do uh, with the 20 feet uh, in width uh, was recognize that this is a private development. Uh, we are providing two means of access into the project site. So, you know, in theory, the sure. idea behind two means is if there was that fuel truck that was parked on the other site, that there's still another way in uh, for that fire truck or emergency vehicle, or if there was a storm and an entrance was, damp was blocked, there's still a secondary means of access into the site. So. We did try to recognize that. In fact, that's one reason why we went to a f we went to the full section for the secondary access, not even an emergency sure. section. So we tried to to recognize that. And you know, uh, as far as the loop, if the way we've des designed this is there's actually two primary loops uh, for the development here, and another loop here, and and that was it, it fits the development well, creates that neighborhood, but it also provides very nice circulation so that nobody is, is, is trapped or if a fire truck comes in isn't in where he's got to turn around and back up and move out. There's that full motion in either direction around it. Now granted we have this driveway here to these four simple units here and the same over here, but those are very, very short sections of, of roads coming up in there. And as we indicated, we will be sitting with the fire chief to talk about those. Um, but we tried, uh, you know, as Joel reminded me, he is, gonna, he is contemplating 
pursuing some level contemplating depends on how it all works out pursuing some level of lead certification for this project which is leadership in environmental engineering design and you know reducing pavement width keeping you know we want to be safe we want to provide those accesses and we'll meet with the fire chief and go over public safety and those sort of concerns but we were trying to be conscious of all of that when we designed the project so my concern is that the, you know that we do have a code mm -hmm. and we're talking about a substantial project for Cape Elizabeth and the code minimum is 22 feet. We have altered the code in some cases, but we've only done it, to my knowledge, when there are trees in the way. I mean, even for private access ways, we've been very careful about, Peter can talk about this too, about keeping to the standards as they're written, as opposed to willy-nilly letting people put in narrow roads unless we have to mow down trees and do things like that. So I remain somewhat concerned about the width and certainly want to hear from the fire chief but just in general I remain concerned about the width of the road which I do think is not within the spirit of the code or even the letter of it at this point. Well, sir, uh -huh. Is there um, any any proposal maybe to sprinkle put sprinklers in these units? Uh, no. no, they're not intended. To sprinklers. The units are not right. intended to be sprinklered, right? Okay. So Anybody fall into the residential. Um, any response on the roads at all or direction? Well, you made the, it sounded like there was some, I don't know if confusion is the right word, on sight lines, how the peer review, um, let me see if I can find it again, the distance measurement and uh, the old, uh, the original design uh, did meet the sight lines, and I actually was out there with Scott, I believe, and we walked it, and yeah, he's right, it does. But now it's different, and the peer review, of course, when I'm, now I'm talking, I can't find where it says, but the... Uh, 384 or something? Um, it, it's kind of, it's non indeterminate. Can you address, yeah, I don't know if you can talk about the sight lines at all. Well, the, the, the peer review was, actually, the peer review of the sight lines was for the original... Uh, original design and when we moved it if you go out there we actually found that our sight distance improved uh, because uh, as you the original entrance was down in this location right here and looking that way was fine looking this way had um, a vertical curve that uh, it fools you. I mean, I, I, I do yeah, remember we that. Went out there, so. measured it, and I think uh, when Paul Godfrey was still here, he or uh, I, I, I don't know. If, I think he met our traffic engineer. It was I, it was Scott and I. Scott, you and Scott went out there. Okay, yeah. I couldn't remember if it was Paul or who. But and then by moving it this way, the uh, sight lines actually improve because you're more towards the crest of the hill. That is here. true. That's true. And down here, the same thing. It's much. Uh, flatter down okay. in this area looking back and what we found was is we actually improved them. The standard we applied is a table in the ordinance uh, that has uh, been consistently used in the past for um, identifying you know what you had to meet for sight lines which we do meet and we followed that protocol for both entrances, but moving it down, ironically, increased, improved the sight lines. Okay. Hi, Barbara. Yes. I'd like to, um, uh, I, I guess I'm a little confused on what the current project, what the difference between the, the um, original project and the current project and what you still have to do or provide to the board. I got an impression from the plans, you know, there, there's notes that say the preliminary plans, and then also the comments from um, OST Associates says we're waiting for more information mm -hmm. before they can do their final review. And I'm, so I'd like to know what is left to do and what we're still going to receive from, from you. The, what, what is left to do, what we had wanted to do, and we met with staff and talked about this, is we wanted to come back to the board with the layout, um, the design, the tentative utilities, 
the open space, the density calculations, all of that, which we're not proposing to change as we go forward. But what we didn't do was we didn't actually generate the detailed road plan and profile utility design. We didn't finalize the pump station design. We haven't actually finalized the stormwater runoff calculations or filed our permits with the DEP. And what we wanted to do tonight was come back to the board with this information, get some feedback from the board in a formal setting. And if this design approach is um, agreeable with the board or the board feels that we are following consistent with the ordinance sort of at a preliminary le level then our next step is to do the actual utility plans the detailed grading the stormwater design file our permits with the DEP and and go through that process which will take several months and frankly it's <coughs> fairly expensive to do too the applicant has to expend quite a bit could we go Did I back? Did your question, Scott? Well, it, it does, so a little bit. So what I'd like to do, I'd like to, for you to go through the original application um, dated August 31st, 2001, and go through each section for me. Some will be, like, real quick, and some will be, um, yeah, this section is going to change, we're going to provide new information to the board, okay. All right? Um, what I Before we do that, could we go back to the sight lines for a minute? Yes. You said you had better sight lines. But could we have a letter or something from um, the site reviewer, the, the traffic, and, yeah, see, you know, the review? My, that's going to yeah. come out of this exercise that we're going to do right now. Oh, okay, because we need, to, we need to have that as hard and fast information. Um, Scott, are you referring to going through the sections that was in, like, Maureen's memorandum? No, I'm Balls. talking about your, ap your application. Yeah. <laughs> In that case, I'm going to have to actually ask if I can. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, I have yeah, one. Never mind, we got it. Yeah. I, I don't think this will be as painful as no, it may sound. No, that's fine. No, 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 I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, the application letter, I mean, is, I don't know that I have to say much about that, but it, in the application letter, we just described the process, the building design, uh, what the project permitting was going to be involved, uh, what the our objective was, and um, all of that general information, which was updated in the cover letter I recently submitted to you. Well, as an example, tonight you talked about two waivers, and in your original application you asked for three. Now, maybe I, I yeah, missed still, something. The, but the waivers are still the same. Okay, so you're still asking for the waiver of the topographic survey? Yeah, there were three waivers. Actually, in the original application, uh, there were three waivers, A, B, and C. One was the one inch equals 40 feet. Uh, and to go to one inch equals 100 so we can put it all in one plan. The second waiver was this uh, waiver for a soils report and lot by lot soil suitability analysis. And then the third waiver was a filled topographical survey within the Sprague parcel. In the Sprague parcel, this piece here, we're not actually doing any development in that parcel there. We did obtain from the town, the town had uh, the whole town flown with two foot controlled aerial topographical information which is what's on the plan and so what we're asking for and, and maybe we don't even need to ask for a waiver since we've got that controlled topographical survey from the town but we did not go out and on the ground do a topographical survey because we saw no gain or benefit in doing that especially with the additional information the town had. Now and so are you asking for another waiver um, essentially tonight for the road width? Is that a waiver, Mark? Well, I, I guess I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it is because we're not pr proposing a public road, so... You're going to look that up? Yeah. Okay. You want me to... Keep going, yeah. Okay. If you want, if you want me to give more detail, and just ask me and I'll, yeah. I'll spend more time. The second one was the actual application form. Uh, we're still asking for the same, a major subdivision review under section 16-2-4 uh, of the subdivision ordinance, and we're asking for a resource protection permit under section 19-8-3 of the Section 3 is the site location submittal, uh, which just shows the location of the project on the USGS map. Uh, section Exhibit 4 uh, is a copy of the town's uh, tax map 
with the list of the abutting property owners. Uh, section 5 is the property deed uh, for the project which includes uh, the purchase sale agreement for the spray parcel and the property deed uh, when Joel obtained um, this piece. The two pieces. Yeah. Oh, and all you need to do is um, just say there's a change or not. You don't need to Oh, describe okay. It. You don't want me yeah. to go through the whole thing. No, okay. I don't need... Yeah. Uh, the next one, Exhibit 6, is the Class B High Intensity Soil Survey. There's no change from that. Okay, so the work by Mark Hampton is still... For the soils, yes. Still we good. We did change the wetlands, though, from what Dale Brewer and that's right. reflected on our plan. Okay. Uh, exhibit 7, 7 is the Flood Insurance Rate Map. There was no change from that one. Uh, exhibit 8 is the Statement of Technical Capability, and that has remained unchanged. Uh, exhibit 9 is a statement of financial capacity, and that has remained unchanged. Uh, exhibit 10 is the community impact analysis. Uh, that has remained unchanged because our density has remained unchanged. Exhibit 11 is the Portland Water District uh, letter. Um, actually, there is a change to that because in this letter it talked about a flow of 934 gallons per minute in your packets. We actually had a flow test done out in the field in September, I think it was, of last year. Right. That showed a flow of 1,085 gallons per minute, um, and that's included in your packet, so would, that was a change. Would you please, uh, while you're on that, get a letter from the new fire chief saying that that is substantial? Because yep. that was one question that was raised before, right. saying the, that that was inadequate. So I think we do need, we absolutely need a letter from the, the new fire chief. The concern was is the flow originally that was like 1995 data showed below 1,000 right. gallons per minute. The fire chief wanted higher than 1,000 gallons per minute. So we actually went out and did a flow test. But we need the letter from the fire chief. You should know, though, that the, the fire chief just left. I know. Wrote a memo saying that he wanted at least 1,000 gallons. But his we. Me his memo explicitly said 1,000 gallons, and the applicant has submitted information showing that their test shows okay, that so they you're have saying we don't above 1,000 gallons. Another letter. So, well, I mean, I think you could ask the new fire chief for the same thing. It's just that. The applicant has met the requirement of the old fire chief. Certainly, you can ask the new one. Oh, okay, that's fine. I just didn't see any, you know, any yeah. agreement with that. But can I ask before you go forward? Yes. Looking here at the uh, community impact analysis, mm -hmm. it has some um, on, under traffic system section B has some fairly specific projections on your phasing plans for the development, and you've now said that your phasing plan is much more up in the air and may change. It was something I was going to ask you about later. But it seems to me that at least that part of uh, that submission may need to be updated as you redo your phasing. Um, we didn't, uh, when we did the traffic evaluation, it was reviewed by uh, Wilbur Smith we didn't actually differentiate between traffic generated from each phase. They looked at the traffic generated at full build-out because that's when the biggest impact would be on the project. So the traffic study looked at um, uh, full build-out for uh, the units in both peak hour and average daily and also a capacity analysis of Eastman Road. So, I mean, we could, we can. It's not a, it's very simple to do to break out what the average daily trips are in each phase, uh, but I'm not sure that information is going to provide any real benefit um, for, for the project. It's really the full peak build out that everybody's concerned at, but if it's something you'd like, we certainly can do it. It just strikes me that the design of the roadways has changed significantly from the original plans to the current plans, and that you know, that part of this might need to be updated so that the final documentation reflects what's in the final plans, either in this part of the text sure. or in supplementary notes for the final document. Okay. I, we can certainly do that. Um, exhibit 12, public works, sewer service letters, and pump station calculations. Um, the, because we're not changing the density, the flow rates stay the same. Uh, when we submit our final design, there may be some subtle changes to the pump station design based on elevation head, uh, technical stuff in, in, in the pump station. 
Oh. Whether or not it wants to be a change. Oh, uh, exhibit. Pardon, pardon me. In, in Exhibit 12. Yes. The letter from the, the public uh, public works department indicates 82, 80 gallons per day, but the calculations that are three pages back show 13,992 gallons per day, and I wasn't sure why the discrepancy was there. That may be, uh, there's average daily flow, and then there's peak flow on the peak hour during the day. I'll have to look at that to see. Yeah, if chart three pages back shows a yeah, total average daily flow of 13,992. 46 times three bedrooms, additional flow. Oh, 13,992, 46 times three bedrooms times 90 gallons per day. And you said 8280, you're correct? We'll uh, get a hold of Bob Malley and have the letter updated. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, well, you say you're going to have the letter, letter updated. Um, is the information provided by the public to the, uh, the Bob Malley, is that the maximum, 8280? I, I don't, I, I think we gave him original calculations that we must have updated during the course because the process was we actually wrote a letter uh, to the public works director and gave him what we thought we were going to generate and he wrote back whether he could have the flow or not and my you expect you're going to say Jesus changed to 13,992 and he's going to yeah. because it says the town is allotted 0.175 million gallons per day based on just stipulated agreement uh, I, I, I will follow up with him but I believe that that 8280 was a projection we probably gave him Okay. Uh, back then, it got updated. So we'll confirm that. Um, exhibit uh, 13 was the wetland determination and vernal pool assessment letter. Um, that is one item that has completely changed. We retained woodlot alternatives. We went through the Army Corps of Engineers, and that information was included in the recent packet that we submitted. So th their, s their total submittal is the one-page cover letter in the site plan? And our plans that were updated to reflect the, the right. wetland mapping. That's right. correct. Okay. And uh, Exhibit 14 is the Maine Historic Preservation Office. Uh, we had a letter from them. Uh, that has not changed. Uh, we also... Um, that has not changed. Okay. A letter from uh, Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Uh, that has not changed. A uh, letter from the Maine Natural Heritage Program. That remains the same. Stormwater Management Report and Calculations. That will be updated because of the, uh, uh, the changes in the design. So that will change and that will be submitted as part of the final uh, design details. Exhibit 18, which is the stormwater infrastructure maintenance plan, uh, that will have some changes to it, uh, but it's uh, pretty much a template and uh, required by the DEP. There may be some minor changes to reflect this current design. Exhibit 19, the erosion and sedimentation control plan. Uh, the only thing that will change on that will probably be the, the projected schedule for construction. Exhibit 20, which is the association documents, those will change. Uh, we uh, need to add uh, some information in there about what the public works director um, had requested notation about, notation about the roads remaining private and cannot be accepted uh, by the town. And there may be some other changes as we, as the town's attorney completes a final review, if any of the board members have questions or comments. So those generally do evolve. So he wanted those in the... Con the well, he said he wanted on the plan. <coughs> we talked that we could put them right in the association documents maybe too as a stipulation that it would remain private and not, not offered to the town for acceptance. I'm not... 
or I guess it would be more under the restrictions, covenants and restrictions. Yeah. I'm sorry, covenants That's and right, restrictions. I'll, I'll, Thank you. You guys should figure that out a bit. I don't see yeah, I, putting him in the bylaws is going to help more and help less. I think the plan notation and the conditions of approval. Yeah, maybe. I, I guess. But let's. I'll see what you submit and then we okay. can take it from there. Uh, the next item was the traffic impact study. Uh, that study, uh, uh, other than the site distance, which we remeasured, um, <coughs> stays the same. Uh, we did have that one peer reviewed. The peer reviewer uh, question, uh, we had made uh, an estimate on the distribution of 55 and older and under 55 and older. And the peer reviewer said that um, even if it was all families, or, under, or even if it was all non-age restricted, that it still wouldn't have an impact on, on, on the capacity of Eastman Road or the road <coughs> network system. So, we're not proposing to uh, do any changes on that uh, based on that, that feedback. We, I'll, I'll say this again, you know, based on what we've seen, I mean, th this development is set up as single level floors. Um, it is set up without, uh, it's not very amenable to families. So it is targeted specifically for that market. And, and you know, it could be somebody who comes in who's 50 years old and is an empty nester and you know, wants to live in a condo and not a house. So our goal is not to, you know, we don't want to draw that exact distinction. You know, it might even be a young couple who, you know, doesn't have kids and, and or not a family. I, I don't know, but I, I, I don't think that would happen because uh, the, the demographics of the folks that will be in there. What I've done a number of condominium projects for another very large Southern Maine developer down in Kennebunk Wells up in Thompson, and they have done very well focusing on this market. And one in Kennebunk, which was over 300 condominium units um, down off of High Street, um, what they found was is that a big chunk of their residents were only, and it was hitting the same market, was only their part of the year. Many of them lived in, in, in the winter. They went away, and then they came back in the spring. And it was set up very similar to how we're proposing this. So we just feel strongly that, that, that we're going to really hit that 55 and older market. So, but while, while you're on that, there was a, a, the town did a survey, is that not correct, of all the condominium units in town. It was really rather astonishing. Yeah. I think there were only 11 children in, I don't even know how many units. 300. 300. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very comfortable that this is going to attract um, Probably mostly older people who want a smaller unit. Younger people are m more likely to perhaps look for something that they can expand into right. uh, over time. And but Joel has had some calls along those lines that, 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 you know, that type of demographics of folks that are looking yeah. for they, they don't look very amenable to families either. But while we're on the traffic, mm -hmm. on, on the site distances, yes. could you please provide that for us? Yes. Um, documentation with the one of the traffic engineers that the site distances are in fact this yep. as opposed to you know that because we do have two and I would prefer perhaps I don't know how the rest of you feel but that it be the peer review person that that substantiates what they are and and whether or not they feel that it's adequate because we have two very different opinions about site distances I mean they really are very different Could I explain that? yes please do the problem is there's two different standards in the subdivision ordinance. And I mean, makes I hope, it, well, it's but, not clear. You know, let, let's just point out that in the comprehensive plan, one of the things the board has been asked to do is to rewrite the subdivision ordinance. And the more we go into it, the more you see why it needs, to, it needs an overhaul because there are places where it, it's at loggerheads with each other. And one of the things the board did several years ago is to try to address the standards of road construction because there was a concern that the road construction standards that were in the ordinance were creating, to quote one counselor, a highway through the woods. So the road standards were revised. They were revised to create narrower traveled way widths, uh, to, to require sidewalks. And in order to document that, there was a new thing put into the ordinance called the Road Classification Standards Table. And the idea was that if you use that table to design the road, you get a road that feels like a neighborhood road then, rather than a road that feels like a highway. 
So that table actually says that for local roads, and this is what would be classified as a local road, it sets a, a minimum and a maximum site distance standard. And that standard is lower than the standard that is in another part of the ordinance that's a, quite frankly, a leftover from the highway through the woods standards. And what happened is the, the peer reviewer grabbed the wrong standard. And this was discussed by the board last year. We went over the road classification standards uh, in the road classification standards table, and the board did tell the applicant that was, we were going to continue to use the road classification standards table. And under that table, the site distance that was provided under the old design was more than adequate. And if the current site distance is more than the old site distance, it would be even more, more than adequate. Well, can we just get that in a letter from... Yes. Because I didn't see that anywhere about the site, the new site distances, unless I missed the page. Yeah, it's, on the, it's actually right on the site plan. We put it, you know, maybe we should make it a little more legible. But <laughs> well, I couldn't find it on this either. I looked and looked. Yeah, it's on sheet two of, of 18. Okay. And it's right up next to the location, between the location map and the unit options. And what it says is um, the... Uh, site distances at the west entrance. Which number is that? Uh, sheet two of eighteen, and it's right. It looks just to the left of the location map, and right and to oh. the right of the unit option. Oh, no problem. So, <laughs> so we actually put those on the plan and, and still feature those. I think a while back, Maureen and I actually met out there and walked the new entrances, too. And the visibility was better in these locations. Um, anyway, uh, continuing on. Uh, the next item was... Uh, I'm going to make sure I'm not skipping anything here. Traffic, uh, building uh, perspectives and floor plans. Uh, those did have some changes to them. Uh, color schemes, <coughs> which is what we showed. Whoops. Yeah, right there. Uh, we did make some color ch changes, and we'll, we'll provide more copies in the next metal color for the board. But that was in response to concerns of, of having too uniform of a look trying to break this up. So uh, the developer went back and looked at some options for varying the color schemes um, on the project. The uh, next item, which is Exhibit 23, was the 11, 11 inch by 17 reductions of the site plans and elevation plans. And of course, those changed, but are included in the included in the most recent submittal. Other questions? You're right, Scott. Anybody have any other questions? I have some, but yeah, I'm Yeah, well, we should get back to um, the road width uh, and give some direction to the applicant, I think. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and the, I, can, I can go back and confirm this with the town manager, but what I've done is I've gone through the road design standards and I believe that the applicant does need to get waivers on the right of way and on the road width. I am, however, very uncomfortable giving that advice because these are basically the same standards that all the old condominium projects that were approved in Cape Elizabeth were approved under, and none of those projects ever asked for waivers. Of the road width in... And, the, and the, the real challenge is that if you go through these road standards, it is, it is very clear to me that they were written for single-family subdivisions. They were not written with condominium projects in mind. Right. Anybody else uncomfortable with? Um, Marie, what section did you find those in? They, they're under they're under the um, subdivision laws. There's yeah, a not, not in there. zoning. I will go no. section on page 20 of the subdivision ordinance, and it's section 16-3-2, road design and construction standards. It, it is useful to read the purpose statement, which is the purposes of the subdivision road standards are to minimize traffic safety hazards and the cost of municipal maintenance and reconstruction to ensure that roads are consistent with the town's rural character, to promote the community and to be consistent with the comprehensive plans, 
The standards shall be flexible where an applicant can demonstrate that alternative approaches will meet the above stated purposes. And there's several balancing type standards there. For and some of them just clearly don't do not fit right. what we have approved in the past for condominium projects. So who 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 would be the best to get uh, independent uh, opinion on the, the change in the standard here from 22 to 20 feet? That's a decision that the planning board has to make. Yeah. Well, I guess I will. We, but we, we need some more input on that. I mean, I'm not prepared to give the applicant direction on that. Well, I mean, I no. can give you an analysis of the widths of all the condominium projects in Cape Elizabeth. I, I think it's, first of all, those condominiums were built a long time ago. And, and I think that the standards have changed over the last number of years. And I, I think a very important piece of information is that of the new fire chief, because that is critical in terms of safety. And I, I remain somewhat concerned about a 20-foot road. But I don't, you know, maybe the only one that is. I, I do too, but I'm not prepared to sort of weigh in on one side or the other. That well, road. I think we need more information right. from the fire chief yeah. and from um, the public works director who did say in his letter that he, I believe he said he preferred a 22-foot road. Yeah, he wanted 22 feet. Well, they always mm -hmm. prefer a wider road. Well, you know, uh, but he's part of our information source that we need to take into consideration. Otherwise, why have a public works director? So what other, other information do we want from the, to the applicant can to get us before we can make this decision? Uh, one of the speakers tonight asked about the traffic on Sawyer Road, but is that out of our requirement because it's not on well, Sawyer Road? I, I actually had a question, and that was this road safety committee that has been formed. Finished its work. It finished its work. I wondered if they ever considered Eastman Road in light of a new subdivision on it. The, no, the Road Safety Committee was a committee of, excuse me, it was appointed by the. It was ad hoc, council. I know. Um, it included uh, Councillor Dill, uh, of, of two members of the public, the Public Works Director, the Police Chief, the Town Manager, and myself. They met for several months. They. Um, accomplished three tasks, which I'd be happy to provide you a copy of their final report. They did write uh, a traffic calming policy, which was adopted by the council. They did come up with a list of priority improvements. Um, none of their recommendations included constructing sidewalk on Eastman Road or any kind of improvement to Sawyer Road. And, and that was even with the idea that there might be a they focused their, I mean, they focused their Another efforts help. on what they considered the top three priorities. Their top three priorities were the intersection of Route 77 in the town center with, with Scott Dyer Road and Shore Road. Um, they identified the Shore Road Path project as a high priority. Two other areas they identified for pedestrian safety were Mitchell Road and Fowler Road. Get you a copy there. I, I actually have it. They gave it out last night. So I think Elaine and I and Tom, we all have it. And in doing in doing that, were they anticipating that, that this was one of the areas of the town that had been designated for growth, so should, could have this kind of intensive new development, or was that based on sort of existing residential patterns in that area? It seems to me that this kind of development in an area that previously hasn't had it might have affected their analysis were they to be doing it uh, while we're doing this. Their, their scope of their work was not to review new development. The scope of their work was to address existing concerns with road safety, speed, and this area was a designated growth area when they were doing their work um, their focus was on only the areas where they felt there was the highest priority need. I have a question for you on timing of this new road classification standards table, which I gather is one of the newer parts of the subdivision ordinances. And I, if I'm reading the ordinance right, 
that only came into place in December of 2003, which may well be a table revised at least. Yeah, it was in existence prior to that date. I, I, in terms of the t extent to which we need to be concerned of, about prior developments that may have been re approved with narrower widths, it seems pretty clear from this road classification standards table that the traveled way on a local road is to be 22 feet. And there is some fairly mandatory language on page 21, I think, that says, the widths and grades for all subdivision roads shall be, de shall be determined in accordance with the road classification standard table. Yeah, I, I'm feeling pretty strongly that we should very Correct. It sounds pretty mandatory. It sounds to mandatory to me too, and I went through it pretty thoroughly myself. But Elaine, I couldn't really hear you very well. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, I'm looking uh, in the subdivision ordinance. The general language the Mar Marine read the beginning part of, and it was talking about giving us a fair amount of discretion in some of the subdivision standards, about 16.32 road design. But if you look at the part which is actually talking about widths of roads in subdivisions, there's a very specific sentence which says widths and grades for all subdivision roads shall be determined in accordance with the road classification standards table subject to some qualifications, none of which I think apply here. And then if you look at that table that's expressly referenced, a local road does have to have a 22-foot wide travel way. So that that, at least to that extent, it seems like our discretion is fairly limited. I agree. I, I think an argument can be made in a condominium complex where all the land is owned by the association that we don't necessarily have to have a right of way. But I don't think we can, uh, at least I am not prepared to give a, a waiver, which I would consider to be a waiver, for a 22-foot versus a 20-foot road. but it depends on the will of the board. Yeah. Is this a local road, though? It is a local road. It may not be owned by the town, but, hey, Peter, we have standards in there for reasons. Well, I understand. I'm, I'm trying to interpret. <laughs> I think well. road is defined as public or private, if you look back is at it, the definitions yeah. section. I mean, it, it seems to me this is part of the additional information and interpretation we're going to need to even consider whether we can. Well, it's, it's in part a question, can we? And it's another part in question, so do we want we, to? We, yeah. Yes. I agree with you. We, we're going to be coming back, I think, in April. Is that, well, possibly in April. <laughs> um, you know, if, if we could, let us. Um, I didn't really anticipate we would have this discussion over the road width. We, went down to a 20 feet because we felt that within a condominium it wasn't your traditional subdivision with lots and, and, and it's more of a, a private development, more of an access drive coming into it. Um, you know, let a, if it would be appropriate, let us uh, talk to the fire chief, uh, uh, provide you with some more information and if the board still decides at that time that it either can't waive it or it wants to stay with 22 feet, well, we can accept that. But we would like to have a chance to research this a little bit more and um, we, can, we can look at, we have the technology, we can look at turning movements through the development with a fire truck and, um, you know, uh, access for emergency vehicles. Um, this is also, a, you know, also a very, this is not a through street. These are, these are dead ends, very limited traffic. I mean, the, the traffic studies show very low traffic volumes through it, so it's, it's certainly not anything to do with the capacity. I mean, most local road widths are designed, you know, to accommodate a certain volume of traffic, and we're not going to be having any through roads with that sort of traffic through it. it, is, it it's private. It's no connections to other subdivisions or other uh, or potential connections. It's a private development. So there, there is some differences, I think, than, than a public road. Um, but if the board was willing, let us take another look at that and come back with some more information. I certainly understand strong feelings. <laughs> uh, and but and I, I would encourage you to uh, give 
further information with regard to uh, reducing the impervious surface for lead standards and any other beneficial uh, aspects to having yeah. a, a shorter make, or smaller roadway. Make the case if it can be. Uh, I'm sorry. Make the case. I mean, tell yeah. us why we should be. Understood. Well, is everybody in agreement that they? Okay. Yeah. Um, other other questions or uh, direction for the app? Well, I have a, a couple questions about the open space. Um, that your recording plat is sheet two here. Of what? what uh, we have. Yep. Uh, I believe that is correct. The That's one the one that has all the signatures on it. Yes. One of my concerns is that although the designated open space is shown quite clearly on your cover sheet, when I got to sheet two. I actually found that there was no single distinguishing boundary designation that outlined the open space. And I know reading through the history that there was too much information on this page at one point, a lot of things were pulled out. But as I see it now, I was trying to trace, just looking at this page, exactly where the open space boundaries were, and I couldn't do it. So maybe I'm missing something, but if I'm not, um, that may be something that has to be added back into this plan. We, the open space will be, is defined a couple of ways. Uh, one is the plan with the acreages on it and the meets and bounds. Right. So a surveyor or a researcher that would go through it would have a couple of pieces of information. One is uh, what the total area of the open space is and then they can trace the meets and bounds. And we're penny, we're actually putting property money, uh, property pens. Let me uh, see if I can. I couldn't. I, I see your property yeah. pins. And then there'll be a the property pins, and then at your key, I yeah. couldn't see anything that told me that that's what those property pins meant. Oh, I, yeah. Well, generally, a property pin will be a uh, an iron pin that will be set is uh, a surveyor standard with a cap on it, and and that that's a. I don't know if there's a specific separate. It'll have a surveyor's cap denoting a property line or a change in an angle point. Are you talking about just from a plan interpretation? I'm just talking from a plan interpretation point. Oh. If I look at these, this, this plan, which is the only one that gets recorded, mm -hmm. other than your condominium plats and plans, which I assume are separate, because this doesn't have all the We might be able to use like a There's boulder line or something, if yeah, that exactly. would be helpful. Something, so someone looking at this plan, which is supposed to be generic, particularly in terms of what is restricted open space, you could determine that only from this page. I, think uh, I, I, I see what you're asking for. We might be able to do, uh, I'll see if we can do like a bolder line around Something the open like that, space right. so that it draws it out short. The other thing, staying on open space, it looks to me, my understanding is that the entirety of the Sprague parcel is open space. That is correct. It looks to me that if you're on drive B, that you do have the possibility that some of the um, exterior condominium deck space may actually go over that boundary line. On the one, on the unit to the left. To the left. Yep, I, I uh, see that. We can, uh, that's a good point. We'll make and sure. And a couple that. places those buildings actually touch that line. Um, I don't know how accurate you consider this to be at that point. But. Those buildings are. A condominium plan, by definition, will end up eventually doing a condominium plat with very specific ties and dimensions to those, and, and that's the physical space they have to occupy. So condominiums end up being very, very precise plans and right. um, development. So, but I think we would want this to be consistent, and I assume the condominium plan will also show the internal boundaries of the units that don't show up here. That. Yeah, those internal units would be on a plan the architect would, would prepare that shows. The, I, I don't know, is that a, Maureen, is that a requirement? Usually the condominium plats are done after the approvals. Do you, I guess my concern here is we're approving 46 condo units plus a single family residence, yet we don't have the boundaries of the 46 units that we're approving. You only have the bigger building envelope. And I assume it's a fairly simple line that would go down the middle of each one 
But if we're oh, I see it, the dividing of the units. Right. Yep, we can show that. That's sure. specifically what we're I, I understand. For. And one other open space question. If I'm reading um, sheet 12 properly, it looks as though you are planning to remove a fair number of trees at the, on that Sprague property, which is designated as open space. Am I reading that correctly? So I'm seeing uh, the current yes. tree line and the future tree line. It looks like in that open space, a lot of trees are coming down. Nope. Yeah, it's a section. It's a, it's a section about 20 feet wide off the property line, um, just to accommodate construction, uh, the end of the road, and the end of the road construction. But that is in the open space. It, yes, it, it will be allowed to revegetate, but it is needed for construction of the project. Okay, because it, it, your note does say your note on open space, note. Um, 19 says that the open space shall remain in a natural undisturbed state. So that would be we need not to, quite accurate. Yes, correct. We need to accommodate that for the construction easement. Thank you. Other questions? I'm afraid I have a couple. That's fine. Um, That's what we're here for. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're going to include a blasting mitigation plan in your yes. final proposal. Okay. Um, I'll save that technical question for last. I would like reassurance again publicly that the developer has not touched that wetland in the middle of the parcel in any way that that disturbance was before and now you're asking for um, a, a um, wetland alteration from us. Is that correct? Yes. That's, you know, that center part of the site that there was some question when we went on the site walk about who disturbed that. That had been mowed as part of the farm. Is that correct? That's my understanding that it was. Actually, the DEP, um, Chris Redmond from the DEP had been out there because he was called uh, when Joel was, we, they were digging test pits for the soils work out there, and uh, somebody had called into the DEP, and a Chris Redmond responded. And do you still have his report that he went out there and looked at the site and said there was no violations? Fine. I just want that publicly so that it's on record here it's that the, the, you. I think it was in the old smittle, but we'll pull it out again. I, I just want to make it public. Yep this point. Um, the knoll. I, I have two questions about, the, is the road going up the knoll where the trees are? Yes. Now, because there's apparently going to be, there was a comment made in the new, I think in your new um, submittal, that you are going to be removing part of the knoll, is that correct? We are going to be removing uh, most of that knoll uh, that comes in through. Uh, it's, gonna, yeah. You're just going to be excavating the whole thing then? What happens is uh, that knoll, which is, there's the farmhouse right there, and there's the Brock residence. That is that knoll. When we were on the site walk and we walked out of the, of the site, that's oh, that, <laughs> yeah, that's that, yeah, right where the bees, I left before that, so I was lucky. <laughs> um, but that is the knoll that we're going to be removing through there. And we have no choice but to remove it because it's, it's our, really our only way into the site. And in order to meet appropriate road and site access grades, uh, we have to remove that knoll to get into the site. And uh, one question about the, the road going along, is it Mary Brock's property? Yeah. There was a letter from her about the wetlands, the RP2 wetlands on the other, on the east side of it. Um, and is it the sidewalk that's disturbing the wetlands? Is that the part of the... The, if, site work that is. Yeah, sheet 3 of 18 shows that. 
It's about 150 square feet. And the wetland has a little peak that right here, it kind of runs right along, and then it has a little peak that goes in and back out. And it, a very, probably just a few square feet of the sidewalk is into the wetland, and the rest is just the side slope. Uh -huh. Stable it. Now, we, we could just about avoid that wetland if we push the road all the way up against Mary's property line. And what we were trying to do was provide some separation. Between no, I, I agree with the separation. But I'm wondering, I don't know how the board would feel about this, about that, that area is the public access to the, to the trail, though, isn't it? That is correct. Well, I was wondering if we could remove the sidewalk there so the, so the wetland wouldn't be disturbed, but we can't because that's well, public access. But I'm wondering if we could narrow the sidewalk there. It's only five feet. Huh? It's only five feet. Well, you know, make it a four-foot sidewalk. How many feet of wetlands? 149 square feet. Of well, I'm only, thinking about, I'm only thinking about her comment about it being so wet and disturbing it and making it worse. It's unbelievably small. I guess I looked at that. So I, I don't 10 know what... 10 by 15 yeah. is the area we're impacting, an area 10 by 15, essentially. No, I know it's small, but will that affect the rest of the wetland and make it worse or not really at all? Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah, Dale. Yeah, but, would you... Yeah, right, respond? we have Dale here for this. I'm just trying to respond to her letter because Understood. she's in a butter. And, you know, definitely valid concerns. I'm all for wetlands protection, certainly. Um, that particular area there has been disturbed already by agriculture in the past. As you walk through it, you can see, you know, the grades are different. That, that agricultural land directly abuts it. So past land use has already changed what was there as a resource. So you're already looking at a disturbed condition. Okay. I'll accept that. And the last thing, I, I have two other, two other things I'd like to talk about. One is the um, affordable housing. We spend a lot of time in the comprehensive plan talking about this one whole entire night. Now, I'm assuming that this is affordable housing that you have in there since it's under the regulations that are in place now. If you have affordable housing for modern income people, it's between 80 and 150 percent of gross income to afford the house. And I don't know what the figures are because we had the figures from 2004, and they're probably higher now, although they may drop in the next year or two. Oh, um, well, they may drop, but, the, but it was $182,098 in 2004 for a moderate price income. And the regulations now say that if you build three low-income um, units for people who are, who are at less than 80% of the um, medium income, um, then they would be much more affordable. Three versus six, because we're still under the old rules of 5% and 10%. We had a lot of talk about this in the comprehensive plan, and the state is really looking to, trying to encourage low-income housing for low to moderate income people, not moderate income people. And I'm wondering if you would not consider instead of the six, go back to the three and making them 80% income or lower, which is going to be a lower sale price, but you'd have fewer units. But it would also, there are some units today in town that probably are going to be fairly moderate income units, especially with this housing depression that we're going to be facing. But I'm wondering if you would just at least consider that. It doesn't change your plans at all. It, can, it changes the philosophy about what you're doing. And your finances, I'm, although you don't, you'd have fewer units because it's only 5%. The current law says 5% of lower income, not 10. But it would meet a different, I mean, it would mean teachers can't afford the higher rate, probably, or firemen, but they really might be able to afford the lower rate, but you'd have fewer units that you'd have to set aside. Okay. So at least talk about that. No, I know. So take a look at it. All right, and the last question I have, thank goodness, is the, how, the farm unit. And this is in terms of density. And I'm not sure what the regulation is because I could find nothing. If you have a portion of the land that's totally removed from the subdivision complex, which this is going to be because you're going to sell it privately, 
the 15,000 feet. It's really not part of the subdivision. How does that consider, get considered as part of the density for the project? It's, it's the same as Spurwink Woods, where you had a combination of subdivision lots and condominium units. You take a portion of the development and you calculate, you, you come up with a total density and then you decide how much of it is going to be lots and how much of it is going to be units and you make sure you design each of it to meet the individual standards. So for example, in Spurwink Woods, the condominium lot had to be at least five acres in size. Even though the whole entire lot was 25 acres, you still have to meet the individual setbacks and standards once you decide whether you're going to go with a unit versus a lot. So the farmhouse is, I mean, it, it is a part of the subdivision. It's the lot in the subdivision. Because it's, there's only one lot, it is very carefully designed because it has to meet all of the standards all at once. There's no averaging. <laughs> so where we have a maximum and we have an average, it had to be at least, it had to be just under 15,000 square feet. It couldn't, the applicant actually wanted to make the lot bigger and could not. Well, it doesn't meet, what about the standard that has to front on a road and not a public road, but a road in the, it doesn't meet that standard. How does it not meet that standard and still have to meet? I'm just asking how it gets included in the density for density calculation. Because it seems to me that it isn't part of the development. Owens, you have a, an answer? Well, I don't have that specific section of the ordinance, so I'll have Oh, to. I couldn't find anything in the yeah, code you're gonna, specific. You're right. The road frontage is a problem. It's going to have to. It originally didn't have a problem under the old design because it had frontage on the new condominium road. But under the current ordinance, we're going to have to find another place for frontage for that lot. Well, we can extend a, you know, you yeah. can spin the piece of it up to, well, we don't have the, the we don't have a right-of-way in the sense of a, when you say road frontage. Frontage, frontage and access are two different things. You can have frontage in one place and access in a different place. You could also eliminate it, which eliminates a unit, but you can eliminate it too. And just sell it separately. I, I, I'm, well, I guess I have a question to make sure I understand this correctly. Uh, the farmhouse um, frontage. Uh, we have to have frontage on. East, east no, no, no. That's, it, you, that's what she's pointing out. It is not on anything. You're not with a new subdivision. You're not allowed to have frontage on. You need. You can't get your frontage from an existing road. The intent was to design lots to all have frontage on the new road. If it's part of the subdivision. But I don't have any right of way. For instance, my I guess I need to understand how I this this is our property line that runs current property line that runs up like this and then around the Brock Mary Brock property. Uh, in the in the proposed condition, here's our property line, there's the farmhouse. There's the property line, but then it goes up around Mary Brock. So we don't have a, a right-of-way or anything because it's a condominium that, that we could extend the property line down and have frontage on a road. That's right. That's a problem. Where is it, David? It, it's, it, it's very clear in here. Remember we had that same problem? 128 in the open space zoning provisions, which are the cluster zoning provisions. Um, road frontage. The minimum road frontage of each lot shall be 50 feet. However, no individual lot or dwelling unit shall have its required frontage on a public road existing as of June 4, 1997. The intent was to eliminate the opportunity for people to create those long spaghetti or lamb chop lots. Could we simply eliminate the property line and make it one of the condominiums? Yeah. But then you don't have frontage again for that property, for that it doesn't, doesn't need front of the There's lot. no lot. It's just, it's, now it's part of the project and it's part of the association, et cetera, et cetera, which may be an easier way to go. But it doesn't have any access on any public. But it's, but, but I don't but it's, it's front, frontage, it becomes, though. It's not access. It becomes part of the single lot that is this condominium. That is the condominium, and then it has plenty of frontage. The only issue there is it's. 
different market sold, is that correct? As, it as can be sold as a high. condominium unit, as a condo, and, rather than a single family lot. All the, all the My stuff. guess is that they're going to figure out a way to build yeah. their frontage. <laughs> Well, we'll it says clearly it. in here, though, that shall have its required frontage on a public road existing as of. So how are you going to get to that lot? No lot or dwelling unit shall have its required frontage on a public road existing as of June 4. It can get frontage off of the new condominium road how? by redesigning it. <coughs> we'll take a look at that. We, we can... Okay. Or, or you can eliminate it and eliminate a unit. Well, or that's another possibility. Yeah, well, Jill probably won't want to do that, but we, we, we may end up just, you know, if we had to remove the property line around it and make it part of the condominium, I guess. But it we'll isn't just the property line. That's not the only problem. Yeah, it is, because it says lot. If there's no lot line around the farmhouse, then it's part of the condominium lot, and it's got plenty of opportunity for frontage because it's a condominium unit. The problem arises, Barbara, oh, okay. it's a right. single family lot. Right. Okay. Right. All right. Well, work that one out. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm done. Uh, I have, I think, one last question or, or comment. Um, I'm assuming you're going to have a supplemental submission. We will. Okay. And I would encourage you to make sure that you uh, respond as necessary to the recent comments from OST Associates yep. of their March 10th letter. And per their recommendation in that letter, that you go back and look at their comments from their September 11th, 2007 letter and their email of September 12th, 2007. Yes. And make sure that those comments are addressed, again, as necessary, because some of them may be not relevant. Yeah. Not, not relevant. Fair enough. Thank you. Anything else? Anybody have anything else? You're done. <laughs> thank Fine. you very much, Owen. No, nope, thank you for your time. Oh, um, oh yes, we need a motion. May I have a motion from the board? For all that, I'm forgetting. Whatever. A motion from the board. Peter. I have a motion for the board to consider that uh, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Wiley Enterprises LLC for major subdivision review and res resource protection permit for Eastman Meadows, a 46 unit condominium with clubhouse and one single family lot <laughs> located at Eastman Road be tabled until the regular April 15, 2008 meeting. And before I release the motion, is that okay? Are you going to be able to get us all the data we need by the 15th, or should we, at this point, ask to be table it till, till May? When is the April 5th? When is the submittal date? End of this month. Uh, we yeah. better go for May. <laughs> I'd rather go. So I'm, I'll amend my motion to the regular May meeting. I don't have the date, Maureen. Can you help us with that? Oh, I don't have it either. Why don't, I, you, just I say, have why don't you say the regular May meeting? And that, that'll still be legal. <laughs> Um, but I have the 20th to the regular May 20th, 2008 meeting. We have a second. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Thank Good night. Very patient, because I think you're probably waiting to hear any discussion about the Business A Wetlands Amendment. Whatever anybody wants, your wishes. You want to break for a minute? I'm here to keep rolling. Want to break? Okay, let's go. All right. You want to introduce it, Maureen, or what? Sure. Um, what you have before you is an amendment that was previously considered by the Planning Board in April of 2005 where it was recommended for approval and I do have the zoning map available. Why don't I just take that out and move over there.
Uh, this amendment covers primarily the business aid district that's located on Route 77 in this area right here. It basically is the area where Route 77 intersects with Broad Cove Road. The northerly most properties would be the properties just south of Davis Point Lane. And it extends down uh, Route 77, basically ends where the Agway ends. You can't see it on this size map, but you can have a bigger one ready in time. But west of Route 77, as you're heading towards Gray Pond, that area has a large RP1 wetland. What happens when you have an RP1 wetland is you have this 250-foot buffer that extends back over the majority of the land that's zoned business A. Uh, the, the end result is that almost all of those properties in the business district are basically legal non-conforming properties with limited to no opportunity to expand. Um, in, in that situation, there was a recommendation to amend the zoning ordinance to reduce the buffer for those properties. The zoning ordinance currently requires a 250-foot buffer from RP1 wetlands. And there are four ways that you can currently get the buffer reduced. One is if the buffer is actually established from a sand dune as opposed to a wetland. One is if the wetland is less than two acres in size, so it's between one and two acres. The idea being if you have a 250 foot buffer for a wetland that's less than two acres, the area of the buffer covers more than the area of the wetland. The third is if the area is in a densely developed location and the council established a simple measuring tool based on neighborhoods in town that they thought were densely developed where you pick your construction site, you measure 250 feet out, and you draw a circle. And if you hit six main buildings, and main buildings is an important concept, you can't hit detached garages and barns, um, then you're considered densely developed and your buffer can be reduced to 100 feet. The last criteria is if the area you're constructing in is topographically distinct from the area of the wetland. So construction site, wetland, big hill, wetland drains this way, construction site drains that way, and they don't meet. They don't like just turn around and all come together in a circle. So there are four ways that the ordinance currently allows a 250-foot buffer to be reduced to 100 feet. And this, this amendment proposes a fifth way. The fifth way would be if you are a property in the business aid district, and it's only that district. The other, the other business A district doesn't have wetlands nearby. Only that district. If you're a property in the business A district and you are connected to public water and public sewer, you are eligible to have your buffer reduced down to 100 feet. Uh, the rationale behind it was that most of those properties in that area are or were connected to septic systems, all located behind the buildings, all immediately upstream or very close to the abutting wetland. And the idea was that if you could get those properties, some of them fairly high water generators, off of septic systems and onto the public sewer, there would be a benefit, an, an environmental benefit to the wetlands. It should also be noted that a lot of the 250 foot buffer for these properties has already been uh, developed. So it's not a natural 250 foot area. It's an area that's actually much narrower. So, you know, the question would be, are you really losing that much buffer when a lot of it has already been removed for buildings and parking lots? Um, this amendment, again, was considered by uh, the Planning Board in 2005. It was recommended to the from the Planning Board to the Council. When the Council looked at the amendment, what they decided to do instead of adopting it was to refer it to the Comprehensive Plan Committee. So it spent a couple of years before the Comprehensive Plan Committee, and in the end, the Comprehensive Plan Committee recommended that this kind of amendment be adopted. So right now, this is one of the pieces that the Planning Board has been asked to work on as part of the BA overhaul zoning that you're currently working on. However, there is a property in that district that uh, was moving forward to the board, and we discovered that they no longer can look at any expansion at all because there are non-conforming use in the wetland buffer. So the, the Rudy's project can't move forward at all. They're not a permitted expansion of use. And for that reason, uh, the manager requested that this piece of the BA overhaul package be pulled out and dealt with by the planning board separately in a more expeditious manner to give that, uh, that property owner an opportunity to seek some relief. 
So you have that amendment in here. Um, the text, as you can see on, I think it's, um, it's on page two of the text, which is page four of your memo, merely adds under item five, the resource protection one critical weapon district is located in or adjacent to a property located in the BA district, which is served by public water and public sewer. That you've all seen before, but there's another part in here. <laughs> um, Planning board member Hayden called me, asked me to try to work up a different standard, a, a, an additional piece of language to deal with another problem that we're experiencing in the business aid district. And that um, is located two pages beyond what you saw before. Um, the other situation we're having, and it needs to be, the board probably needs to think for a moment about the fact that this is business owned land. Less than 1% of the town is zoned for business. And if you can see with this little pie chart here, um, you know, the little pink area that you can't see, that's the portion of the town that's zoned for business. The, uh, the, that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. The town is mostly residential and wetlands. What it does mean, however, is that we should probably be efficient with the amount of business land that we have because we don't have very much of it. And it seems pretty clear that there's no desire by the residents of the community to expand the amount of business land that we have currently zoned. We, want to, we don't want to have any more than we currently have. So every time we find ordinance amendments, ordinance provisions that reduce the ability to develop in the business aid district, there is a fear that as new development area is needed, we're going to be looking someplace else instead of trying to find a way to make the business zones that we currently have work. So another situation we have is, again, in this business aid district, we're pretty certain that most of it is in this, this wetland buffer. And there has been a determination by the town attorney and the code enforcement officer that while those uses that are in the BA district with the, over, with the buffer overlay sitting on top of them can continue to operate the way they've been operating. Changes to existing uses, expansions of existing uses are prohibited. There's no opportunity for any of the businesses there to expand in any way, not just in, not just in terms of square footage, but really in terms of use. And e so, e even if a use were, quote, less intensive. Even if you had an existing building in an existing paved area, and all you wanted to do was take, for example, a real estate office out of that building and move into it an uh, uh, accountant's office, you would not be able to do that because an accountant's office is not a permitted use in the wetland buffer. Even if you were having no exterior changes, no increase in impervious surface, no, no removal of vegetation, you still would not be allowed to change the use because there are very few uses that are actually permitted in the critical wetland buffer. So under those circumstances, um, Board Member Hatem asked for a recommendation. What I have attempted to do is to deal with that situation by another amendment which would be in the permitted uses chart of the zoning ordinance. And what that would do is it would establish that if you wanted to do something in the wetland buffer that's a permitted use in an abutting district, that kind of gets, you know, we don't want people to come in and do things in the wetland buffer that they couldn't do anywhere else. So if, if you could open an office in an abutting district, you can open an office in the wetland buffer in an existing building as long as you're not creating any exterior pavement or any exterior land use changes. That was the attempt of the draft that reads expansion of a non-conforming use where the activity is permitted in an abutting district and is located in an existing building or paved area. So I'm done. I'd also like to say we spent a lot of time talking about this in the Comprehensive Plan Committee, and the committee was very much in favor of uh, making this a goal and a recommendation, with the condition that any business um, that wanted to have that buffer reduced had to be on public water and sewer. So that was kind of the trade-off. How, how close is the sewer to this area? It, it's, it's right near there. The, um the sewer was brought up to the intersection of uh, Broad Cove Road and Route 77, and I believe there's like a force main that's extended from there 
over to the good table. So it's right, it's on Route 77 now on the northern end of the district. The Agway is not on sewer. No, yet. it's not on sewer. Which is why you need the Second Amendment. We hate an amendment. <laughs> 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 so the good Don't table. Don't misspell that. <laughs> <laughs> the good table is on sewer. Yes. So do both parts of this require connection to sewer? No. Or just the second no. part? No. No. First, first part. the first part. The first part is a reduction in the buffer if you give us the environmental benefit of going on the public sewer. The second piece is a. It's just in, it's inserting flexibility where there are no physical changes to the. To the property. So you don't have to meet both of those. I mean, there are two different provisions. You could meet one and not meet the other. You could be um, the first. The first one helps you more if you're doing new construction. The second one helps you more if you're changing uses but not doing any new construction. Okay. The second one helps you not at all if you're if you're cutting down one tree or if you have to add some parking spaces. Then you're still out of luck. So that means Agway could put that real estate office in that building. It Even though they're not on sewer. It What's that? It means they could get through the door of applying to put yeah. it in there. Okay. Are oh, they still need a permit? Right. I mean, we still have to right. check things to make sure they have adequate parking and, and all that other stuff. But, but it's not a blanket, no way. No, okay. right now it's a blanket, no way. The door, the door is closed. Right. Yeah. Okay, any discussion? Elaine. Yeah. The way that this ordinance is worded in other sections, does expansion include change or a change and expansion of use two different things um, change of use and expansion of use are two different things so I'm wondering whether we actually need both to accomplish what we want to accomplish wouldn't we would, do we want both expansion or change of a non-conforming use I guess expansion implies it's already there is what you're right. saying and they'd already Yeah, it's it, yeah. This is and this. Did I mention this is the one that has never been the right. wording has never been looked right. at until yeah, we got so it. <laughs> it needs some buffing. But that's all right. I mean, the, procedurally, we set a public hearing if we want to move forward with this. We make a certain recommendation to the town council, who then gets another public hearing, and there's at least two more opportunities to tweak language here. Yeah, and and ideally, if there if there's any desire to tweak the language right now, if someone has a better idea, you should do it right now. So that you can set a fixed text out for the public sure. so they can review it prior to the public hearing. <laughs> that doesn't mean after the public hearing that you wouldn't amend it again based on what you heard or a revelation of a better way to draft it. There's, no op there's plenty of opportunity for the council also to make adjustments. I'd be more in favor of that if it weren't quarter to ten. but. <laughs> <clears throat> Since we we're going to see this again. So everybody happy with expansion or Well, I'm not, I, I, I do think it needs some polish, but I, I think, I, and I understand what Maureen's saying. She's saying we want to be able to release it, but I guess I view the public hearing as an opportunity to get some feedback and, and tweak the language. We've got three weeks before, well, a month now before the public hearing. We can, can we discuss this at our workshop? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The and, language. And, mm -hmm. and, and still schedule. And still schedule the public hearing tonight. Time. Okay, why don't so, so we in favor of that? <laughs> make a motion. Yes. Um, I'd like to move that based on the information presented, this is a wetlands amendment that allow the RP1 buffer to be reduced to 100 feet that allow the expansion or change of non-conforming uses where there are no exterior changes and the activity is permitted in an abutting district located in section 19-6-9 of the zoning ordinance be tabled to the April 15, 2008 meeting of the planning board at which time a public hearing will be held. We have a second. Second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Everybody wants to go home. <laughs> <laughs> so moved. The, the other thing just for the public who's here, do we want to put this on our workshop so if they do want to attend and, and Give us yes, I think we should feedback. just to polish That's it a fine. little bit. So, so we will be discussing here. this. However, I have to warn you again, or say, not warn, but say again, at the workshop we do not take public comments. If you have any comments, and we already have had a number of emails, we have them, we've read them, um, take them into consideration certainly, but the public hearing won't be until the next 
regular session of the Planning Board, which is the third Tuesday of April or April 15th. So we thank you. You've all been very, very patient. Anything else? We have a, maybe if nobody has anything else, we have a move to adjourn. Move we adjourn. Second. All in favor. All right. Um, I think, um, right. do you second the adjournment? Yeah. This is amazing. Oh, do you second the adjournment? Everybody, everybody, yeah. everybody is out of the adjournment. We need that for a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah.